This is Comic Geek Speak, episode 1547, Spotlight on the Fantastic Four in the John Byrne Era. I'm Brian Chrisman. I'm Shane Kelly. I'm Adam Murdo. I'm Chris Eberly. And I'm Brian Deemer. And welcome to the show. Yes, as we continue our Spotlight series, uh, this time going back to the Fantastic Four. Uh, as my records indicate here from the uh, CGS episode page, um, back in February of 2014, uh, we did part one of the Silver Age as well as part two. That's correct. And then it looks like we stopped with the Bronze Age last July was the last time we touched on the spotlight of the FF. And then we did the Doctor Doom one. Right. But a it's a subsidiary, yeah. So we're going to continue on here with, I guess we're calling it the John Byrne era because it's not necessarily all his no, work. No, that's it's... a good point, my friend. To maintain sort of the continuity of the checklist, we are going to pick up with issue 201 which was, did not involve John Byrne, but those are important stories that should be acknowledged. And then we're going to go all the way through uh, Marv Wolfman stuff, Doug Munch stuff, and then into John Byrne. So that's we're going from issue 201 to issue 293, right. well, Now, wait a minute. I wasn't consulted on that. This is the John <laughs> Byrne era. We're starting with issue 232. That's it, you know. Chris, what? What, 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 what's going on here? I'm just That's kidding. not the beginning of the list. <laughs> well, you know, John Byrne's issue, 232. <laughs> Actually, my friend, he did pencil many issues before that. Yeah, well. <laughs> God, I miss this guy. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that, that's sort of going to be our scope of this episode. So strap it's going to be a long ride. Absolutely. All right. And a fun ride. Of course. I, again, for me... These spotlights, especially on things I haven't really, really read, get me jazzed. Like, oh, I got to drop everything I'm doing and read these things right now. Of course, I don't always do that, but that's the kind of enjoyment I get out of the episodes. And I'm just sitting here to listen to these guys talk. I'm right there with you a lot of times. <laughs> Pansy, we're happy to titillate your interest. Oh, <laughs> boy. Well, before we get into the festivities, first, a few words from our sponsors. <laughs> this episode of Comic Geek Speak is brought to you by SuperheroStuff.com, where you can go to for all of your superhero, superhero stuff. stuff. Excellent, excellent timing. Spring has sprung at, su- at Superhero <laughs> Stuff. So they've got all their spring items up on their site. Of course, you know, T-shirts, hats. Uh, well, you, guys, you know, you can wear still hoodies in the spring. Sure. It's still a little chilly yeah. there. And of course, all superhero themed, geek related. Whether it's you know the new uh, Age of Ultron T shirts uh, that they have right now for the upcoming Age of Ultron movie, uh, they've got like new pop figures. That's dead- right. You better you better get your T shirts now so you can wear them to the premiere, right? Exactly. Which was is Friday, May first, just around the corner. So you still have time. You do still have time. <laughs> also, the hero of the month this month is Deadpool. <laughs> extra, extra discount on Deadpool items. And again, you know, check with them, I like to say, early and often because they're always updating sales, updating coupons, time for their newsletter, all, all these, all kinds of great stuff, uh, free shipping options, all kinds of the best sellers on sale. So you've got to check them out, like I said, early and often, superherostuff.com. And this episode of Comic Geeks is also brought to you by Scribd. Scribd is like Netflix for comics. With a subscription, you'll get access to over 10,000 comics from Marvel, IDW Top Shelf, Valiant, Dynamite, Archie, and more. They're the only subscription service that gives you that variety all for one monthly price. On top of that, you'll also get unlimited access to their huge library of ebooks and audiobooks, more than 1 million titles available. Altogether, all available anytime. Anywhere. So head over to scribd.com slash comic geek speak to get started with a free month. Even I'll more- tell you what, that's Oop. that's pretty cool. Um, the comics is a brand new thing. Yes. In fact when they when they approached us to be a sponsor, they uh, they didn't even have the comics. Mm-hmm. 
and it was already a cool deal because the audio books alone are worth way more than the price of admission, right? But now mm-hmm. you throw in some comics, pfft, come on. Yep, yep. <laughs> They're always expanding. And uh, you, <laughs> yeah, I had my script to repair it. He jumped it, but that's fine. <laughs> that, no, that's fine. We want to get some <laughs> script, Schmidt. <laughs> <laughs> We're off the cuff here, baby. They're paying the bills to keep the lights on here. We got <laughs> even more importantly, <laughs> script makes sure you can find your way to comics and books you're going to love. They've got hundreds of collections cur- curated by their team of editors, and as you read, they'll tailor recommendations for you based on other titles you've loved or not. So go to scripted.com slash comic geek speak right now and they'll set you up with a free month to get started. That's 30 days of unlimited reading and you'll be supporting this show. So it's a win win situation. That's S C R I B D dot com slash comic geek speak. All right. So um, before we get into the show, I want to talk about I'm, – I'm very excited to be here tonight, not only because I love uh, the um, John Byrne Fantastic Four, um, but also like the 10-year the anniversary show and the London convention sort of, you know, stoked my fire a little bit. So <laughs> I'm uh, happy to be participating again. And uh, it, it – there's like a project that I've sort of been wanting to do for years – uh, that I think now is the right time to do it. And uh, I talked to all the guys, and they were all equally as uh, encouraging. So we're going to... Um, I'm going to sort of spearhead a new endeavor for CGS, and uh, it's going to be some video. Uh, you know, podcasting was a frontier 10 years ago, and, and now, you know, the commonplace of video on the internet is is, is uh, incredible when you think about how hard and challenging video used to be years and years ago and now it's everybody with a with an iPhone is making a video on YouTube right now many of them suck um, no <laughs> doubt but but there's lots of good content out there and I've been wanting to do video for a long time so we're going to start doing some CGS video uh, in the beginning it's going to be pretty much just our our uh, episodes, but with some cameras in the studio. And so if you want to watch us talk on on your TV or on your computer, you could do that in lieu of just listening. And, uh, you know, we might grow from there. We'll see how it goes at first. And then maybe I have a couple ideas for some possible, like, video-only projects, but that's down the road a little bit. So uh, I, uh, you know, purchased some of the equipment, and I'm in the process of getting some, some things set up. Um, but needless to say, anyone who knows some stuff about video knows that uh, video equipment is not cheap. Not cheap at all. Um, and so I'm going to actually reach out to the audience uh, in hopes that perhaps they can help us a little. We did this, oh God, I want to say like six or seven years ago when we needed a new computer. Oh, yeah. We, yeah. we had a little fundraiser uh, and we asked people in the audience to give us five or ten bucks or whatever and... Um, you know, hopefully so that we could buy a new computer and it worked. And the second we got to our goal, we said, no more. Keep your money. You know, we, we got what we need. We're not out, you know, begging. Right. Uh, so I'd like to do the same thing right now. I'd like to officially sort of kick off a uh, donate if you if you can and if you're interested uh, fund. And uh, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask for a thousand bucks. Uh I've already spent more than $1,000, and I don't quite have everything we need yet, but I think $1,000 would be – is all I'm really comfortable asking for, right? Mm. I mean, with video, you know, we could spend $20,000 and not oh, have enough God. if you if you really wanted to, right? But, I uh, got to get a makeup artist then if you do yeah, that. For, for that money, it's going to make us all look great. Jeez. Oh, my God. Well, with cameras and lights and all this stuff, I mean, you know, anybody who does video production, they know yeah. that even $20,000 is cheap, right? Um, but I'm, I'm making do with about 1000 bucks. So uh, if you would like to contribute, um, you can just – on our website, we have the PayPal donation button. Uh, and I'm not I'm not setting up like a special donation thing. We're just going to use the regular thing that people do use from time to time, and uh, 
well, we'll keep you updated and we'll post, you know, maybe on the Facebook, like, uh, what, what, where we're at with our goal. I'll just keep track of it and, uh, keep everybody in the loop. And then, uh, we'll stop asking when we get to a thousand dollars. Does that sound fair? Yeah. Well, <laughs> you're asking everybody else, I guess, but to me, it sounds fine. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I'm asking you guys too, you know? Yeah. All right. Let's talk about Fantastic Four. Yes. All right. So you sort of have the background where we left off and, um, Chris, I mean, Professor Eberly, I yes. should say. Oh, the the please, floor please. is now yours. So send the rostrum once again <laughs> and address your pupils. Well, with my uh, co-professor, because once again, Adam has a delightful uh, notepad there of in diminutive scrawl. <laughs> oh. No doubt supplemental. <laughs> you, surf said, you said scrawl. Yeah, and his yellow, <laughs> his yellow legal pad. I'm just going to transform into a green alien warrior. <laughs> <laughs> that would See, be bad. you know... Brian, this is the kind of stuff you want to put on video. People have to see this type of thing. You know, I just took a picture. I, I know um, Brian Nixon, when he was here for yeah. the 10th anniversary, wanted to see a copy of that. And there was nothing in the studio that we took notice of, probably underneath something. So I just got a picture to send him out, send out to him. Splendid. All right. So what we're going to do, again, for the sake of continuity and honor of continuity, we're not going to skip over the FF stories that in between 200 and when Byrne takes full control of the book. In issue 232, we're not going to spend a huge amount of time on those books, but we're at least going to uh, acknowledge them. Yes, Pants? We also wanted to mention that this era, as well as the creator, was one of Jamie's Absolutely. favorites. So we wanted to just – that's why he also took, took some extra time on this. That's why it's not as timely as it. So people who have been saying, you know, when's next one going to be – you know, we hear you. We, we, we're going to give these as much attention as we can because, you know, we want to do Jamie proud because John Byrne and FF – was one of his favorite uh, creators and comics. You know? Absolutely. And then that's what to, – to piggyback on them. That's why uh, most of us have read the Fantastic Four John Byrne Omnibus, which I think we've all been reading in the past month or so, to prepare. And, and I, for these notes, it was a little more – a little skimpier because we've all read most of these stories now and read them recently. So we can really add a lot of reflections. Actually, that was a hateful teaching term. Sorry. <laughs> uh, a lot of uh, insights into uh, this era. Um so we're going to start with issue two hundred one. Yes, pants. I'm just going. I'm so. I'm so gonna, go ahead. I'm going to be the guy who's going to interject a lot uh, because I haven't really read. I haven't read these quite frankly. I've been, been doing other things, but looking at this, I am just amazed at what John Byrne was doing at this time. For instance, when I see uh, issue two hundred nine, I think was some of his first pencil work, I believe, yes. mm-hmm. which is cover dated. Uh, August of 1979. That same month, he worked on Marvel 2-in-1, number 54, Avengers 186, and Uncanny X-Men 124. So he was doing four, at least in that month, like four books. Now, again, it might have been some twice-monthly thing. I'm sorry, bi-monthly books or whatever. But he was doing all this pencil work. Prolific is is an understatement from from my perspective here. Well, and, go ahead, Pitt Ryan. I'm sorry. drawing... Really, really good artwork. Not like racing and scribbling out some some mediocre stuff. No, it's beautiful. Yes, and again, to interject, but I'll try to keep my comments. As <laughs> John Byrne original artwork from this era, again, especially like the X Men, but even the FF is some of these highly sought after artwork where covers go for tens of thousands of dollars, oh. interior pages go for. Two, three thousand, depending on the maybe even five, seven thousand dollars. And uh, yeah, like the most recent uh, big thing I see is uh, like the cover of FF 256 with the Nihilus sold last year sixty one thousand dollars. Sixty one thousand. Well, that's with all the you know buyer stuff, but 60- and let me tell you, it looks beautiful on my wall. <laughs> 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 that that is the photocopy that I have of the- ah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, I, I didn't mean to do pants derail. Rail. I live for your interjections. That's <laughs> oh, one of the main you reasons you're you got you're great out of the great radio voice there. No, oh, stop it. Now, first of all, I'm hold also on my man hand. Uh, in your man hand? In, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got my son here. We got to keep this at least somewhat G-rated. But um, <laughs> too late. Man hand, ah, uh, pants. All right. Says the Get guy who showed his son the Godfather. Yeah. Well, you know, it was rite of passage. Anyway, <laughs> Modern Masters Volume Seven. Uh, from Tomorrow's, which is all about John Byrne and our one of our most loyal listeners in front of the show, Eric Nolan Wethington, uh, played a role in uh, creating this book. Uh, I think the, t- the title here is very apt and based on what Brian was saying before about just how prolific 
Byrne was. And Mr. Deemer mentioned, you know, you know, this was not shoddy artwork he's producing. That this is man is a modern master. I think the title is very well earned. Um, and when you look at the sheer output in his career, it's it's tremendous. And uh, I know many people consider his run on FF, which ran for over five years, uh, issue two thirty two, where he was writer and penciler, issue and inker actually inked himself in most cases. Issue two thirty two to issue two ninety three. For many people, besides Lee Kirby, this is considered the greatest era in the history of the Fantastic Four. And having just read these issues, I've read them all over the years, but having just read them all again just recently, I firmly agree uh, with that statement. So in addition to going, you know, going over our checklist, of course, we're really going to be focusing on all the different things Byrne did in this book in terms of being both innovative and also uh, you know, paying homage to the Lee Kirby era. And he, does, he does this wonderful synthesis in, term, in terms of both of those uh, approaches uh, to this book and also just ways he kind of shook up the Fantastic Four uh, in this era. I mean as I was going through preparing this, this, uh, these notes, I was just floored by all the different ways he tried to innovate with the team and just change the status quo. From you know redesigning their costumes not once but twice uh, while he was uh, on the book, um, devolving the thing so to speak back to his original less rocky form that he appeared in Fantastic Four number one. I think one of the most important things uh, uh, Byrne did though was really acknowledging how powerful and important Susan Richards is to the Fantastic Four and how he really established her place as in many ways the most powerful member of the team. So he really does a lot with her, everything from just surface things to giving her a new hairstyle because she'd had long hair her entire career. And he, it's the 80s, so he chopped her hair. Um, he really emphasizes her, both her, her role as both a mother and as, as one of the, the most powerful members of the team, sort of her place a, as a woman on the team. During his run, she will change her name to the Invisible Woman from the Invisible Girl. Uh, she, she, she and Reed conce- conceive a child, which she loses in a miscarriage, one of the most – Powerful stories burn uh, renders. It's not in the book we looked at uh, that you have in front of you, but it's a very famous issue that we'll talk about. He also does a lot with Ben Grimm's sort of psyche. And one of the most fascinating plot devices I think Byrne really explores here is that – and we've talked about this a little bit before uh, – is that Ben Grimm has this sort of this mental block where he, he doesn't want to become Ben Grimm again, the human fleshy Ben Grimm because he's afraid – that if he does, Alicia Masters will not love him because he's, he's convinced she only really loves the thing rather than mm-hmm. the, the, the human-like Ben Grimm. And, and Byrne does a lot with that uh, in these stories. I mean that's one of the reasons why he remains on Battleworld right after the, the Secret Wars. I mean he, he goes into Reed Richards' father, Nathaniel Richards. I don't think we ever saw before, right, Murd? You never saw Nathaniel Richards before. No, no. His first uh, appearance was during Byrne's run. Yeah. Yep. He, he brings She-Hulk onto the team. And, does, and of course Byrne also did his wonderful She-Hulk series. Uh, during this time period as well, uh, he brings in uh, you know Frankie Ray, who becomes uh, this love interest for Johnny Storm. Then she becomes the Herald Galactus. We'll talk about her. And what I think one of the most controversial parts of this era is when he has Johnny Storm break one of the fundamental rules of male friends when he runs off with Alicia, uh, and he he and Alicia form this very serious romantic relationship. Uh, while Ben is on uh, Battleworld. Now, of course, they retcon what that was all about later, which we'll talk about. But clearly, that Byrne intended that to be really be Alicia Masters, I'm sure, uh, when he when he created that that plot device. But this this is a, such an exciting dynamic era of the Fantastic Four. All the ingredients that made the FF great that we've talked about in our in our previous spotlights. Byrne takes all that and he just takes it to the next level. I mean, you read these stories and between the visuals. And, and the plot devices and the drama, it, it, you feel the energy of Lee and Kirby, but it's John Byrne. And he, it's, in no way is he copying. He's paying, he's paying homage to that, but he's also doing his own thing and bringing the team very much into the modern era and doing all kinds of uh, innovative things in, in keeping with that spirit. So I've been very excited to talk about this, and, I, and I'm really thrilled to address this, and I hope a way that Jamie would have really uh, appreciated. I, I, Chris, one, o- one other thing that I think – Please, um, sir we can add to that list uh, is he really built up the dynamic between Reed and Sue and made them like an actual real married couple where they argue sometimes and they have some real big issues about ways to look at life. And, 
you know, Sue dealing with Reed's forgetfulness and preoccupation with all of his experiments and everything. And, and, you know, it's a real human element that for the, for the first time it gets, I mean, there are issues that are dark and you're oh, like yeah. worried, are they going to get divorced? I mean, what's going on? I mean, it's, it's, it's serious stuff. Um, I think he really brought that to the surface for the first time. Well put, sir. It, for me, just looking back at this, I, I can't believe this has been between like 30 and 35 years yeah. ago as we're recording this episode. It's like, oh my God, it's so long. And Burns still working today. Oh, I mean, yeah. And still on the, on the internet. And every now and then you just see a John Byrne poses. There. There, you, there you go, John. That's awesome. John Byrne pissing people off for 40 years. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we're not really going to address the the controversy surrounding Burr and the creator, which is probably a whole other episode in itself. <laughs> but we're going to be focusing on the just work, the work yes. here. So, so let's start with our personal reflections on this era. Pants, go ahead. Well, as I as I said, I really haven't. Uh, back, back when I was reading comics as, as a lad, I think I might have had a like. Lad. I'm sorry. I think I remember having I think issue oh, two hundred, which predates this. I don't really know much about this era. I haven't read it. I don't think I have any of it in my collection. Uh, I'm just here to, you know, like I said, absorb and, you know, ask my questions as needed. So I'm looking forward to the discussion. That's sort of where I sit for this. Now, this is my first time reading through any of this. And and for a good chunk of, of my reading career, I haven't read much from the early 80s. I started comics in the mid-ish 80s and beyond. I've read some things of the Justice League from this time, but not much, not all of it. And um, some of this, what, what's in the, the, the big heavy tome that's sitting aside of me, some of the earlier stories I, I actually found a little boring. Um, and it could be that I'm, I'm not used to this kind of storytelling. This, some of this was very Freak of the Week type stuff, a different alien crazy thing coming in and out of every single issue. Once you got past the anniversary issue, I found those stories much more interesting. The negative zone, um, the things that were happening with um, – uh, oh, gosh, what was her name? You just said it. She becomes the Frankie herald Ray. of – Frankie Ray. Yeah. Uh, those were a lot more interesting, uh, the multi-part stories that came later. Um, but through the entire thing, the one thing I will say, the artwork from start to finish is gorgeous, absolutely beautiful. The splash pages, the 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 detail, the, the cityscapes, the – um, interesting composition of certain pages and title pages and covers. I loved it. So I could look at the artwork all day. And and all the stories were good. I enjoyed them all. But the second half of this book I loved compared to the first half. That's not a slight against the first half. I just really enjoyed the Negative Zone story and things that came later in this book. Well, there's there's a, a significant change in tone yeah. from those late Bronze Age stories to you know what we call the burn era, which we'll talk about, and and it, it got much more interesting and enjoyable to, to read. Um, it, it was a thrill to finally read something. I know Jamie uh, again talked talked about this at at length, time and time again, and I picked up a trade here or there, but never ever got to sit down and read it. And and this was fabulous to sit down for a change and read it. Well, uh, I'm in about the same boat as uh, my two colleagues here. Um, mm-hmm. and that uh, yeah, I, I really had not uh, prior to uh, your generous donation, you know, courtesy of Wild Pig Comics in Kenilworth, New Jersey, Chris, of, <laughs> of these complimentary copies Fourth, of the 14th South Michigan Avenue, Kenilworth, New Jersey. <laughs> Thanks, honey. <laughs> Uh, so, so before you, you donated these uh, omnibuses to us, um, I really had not read very much of the Burn Fantastic Four either. I, I've read at most three issues of it, and probably not even that. Uh, the one I read most recently was just last summer, actually, by coincidence, and it was the issue number 267 you mentioned earlier, when uh, uh, the, the loss of uh, Reed and Sue's second yes. child. Um, but uh, I'd heard about uh, Burns' run on the Fantastic Four, and I, I was aware that it has attained legendary status over the years, and uh, you know, not just from Jamie, and certainly I heard about it plenty from Jamie, as indeed we all have, but uh, even before that, long before that, when I was but a uh, wee shaver uh, reading, uh, well, <laughs> yeah, well, not really a shaver, but a lad of uh, well, an adolescent youth just getting started collecting comics in the 90s, um, reading Wizard Magazine, they would occasionally make mention of, of Burns' contributions to Fantastic Four, and uh, from that I was was given to know that all, all these really 
epical innovations that he introduced to the to the title and to the team, uh, most of which you've already itemized, Chris, uh, both uh, orally here uh, behind the mic and also on your very detailed outline. Um, you know, the, the introduction of She-Hulk to the team, the thing being put through his paces, you know, the, the loss of Reed and Sue's second, second child, uh, Johnny's violation of the bro code and stealing Alicia <laughs> away, just, and the, 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 the uniforms in particular. You know, I, I started reading comics in the early 90s, and uh, the, the, the FF were still wearing their black and white burn era uniforms at that time, and it was a couple of years before I even became aware – that the Fantastic Four had ever worn well, blue yeah, they wore uniforms. Those, they wore those uniforms quite a while, the black and white ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so as, as far as I'm concerned, those those were the Fantastic Four's costumes, those black and white suits. And to this day, when I hear Fantastic Four, the first thing I think of is those black uniforms with the white accents. So it's, that's a heck of a design that uh, Byrne slapped on the FF there. And it, it, made it, it had a personal impact on me, that's for certain. Um, but so just in general, though, the, the impression, having read very little of Byrne's FF that I've uh, formed over the years and decades, is that uh, – it, it made the Fantastic Four big again, you know, just really big ideas. The characters felt big. The adventures that they had felt big. They were a little more sweeping in scope out there in space, journeying into the negative zone. Uh, and it, 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 you know, cinematic is a word we might throw into it, you know, sort of uh, – it, it, I'd almost say that Fantastic Four was to uh, you know, the Fantastic Four comics of the 80s what uh, Spielberg was to films of the 80s. Well put, sir. Yes, restoring well that uh, feel of cinematic grandeur that had been sort of uh, worn away by time. Time. Um, so it really made the Fantastic Four r- really cool again. You know, they became once more the first family of, of the Marvel Universe for a little while. And um, so having actually experienced the material firsthand, I am uh, far, far, far from disappointed. Really, really – it's, I'm going to say the word big again because it's, it, it is big storytelling. It is widescreen stuff, and literally in the case of that one issue that's uh, horizontally – Cinematic issue. Yep. <laughs> oh, that drove me nuts reading it in this book though. <laughs> trying to read it in the car, and this is oh, not an easy God. thing to balance in your lap. No, it's not. <laughs> this omnibus. I can't tell you how many times I readjusted my body in the chair, the seat, the table. Oh, <laughs> it's hard to read, but it, yeah, that, that issue was rough. And one other thing I forgot to mention before I give my own uh, introductory insight is – Burns' take on Doctor Doom oh, yeah, is fabulous. so – we have to well, we'll talk about how he does an issue where the Fantastic Four don't appear in their own book. It's just about Doctor Doom, and I think it's a timeless classic. So we're also going to talk about – and we, we mentioned this also. We did our, our Doom spotlight back in the fall. We'll add more to it here, though, of course, from the perspective of the FF. But he has a wonderful take on, on just Doom and, and his sense of grandeur, shall we say. So, <laughs> Well, I think Burns' Doom is Doom. I, I would I I would say that's I would almost agree with that 100 percent. Sir, yeah. I'd, I'd say yeah. his characterization yeah. of Doom has been more influential than just about anybody else's. You know, this side of Stan and Jack. Yeah. So yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd go along with that, Brian. Oh, Murden, I agree. You heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> Alert the media. Now, for me, this era has a special fondness in my heart because. The first Fantastic Four comic I consciously recall buying off a spinner rack in a convenience store. Excellent. Which those days are long gone by. Fantastic Four issue 243, which is the classic Everyone vs. Galactus cover. And I actually have a figurine on my store on the the bookcase. They've actually made a a, a diorama of that cover where Galactus is battling the Avengers, the FF, and Doctor Strange. And like Cap's hitting his boot with his shield and so forth. But when I, 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 I knew nothing about Galactus when I bought that comic. I had not read – I was a kid. I had not read the classic uh, Galactus trilogy from the Silver Age that we've talked about in the past. So I'm like, you know, who the hell is this guy? You know, and I, I bring the book home. I was so awestruck by the epic scope of that issue. Even then, you know, I was probably you know, 10 or 11 years old, something like that. And to see this massive godlike being – Actually being toppled to the streets of Manhattan by the the combined efforts of, of all the Marvel heroes, there, I, even then at that young age, I just realized this is just big. I mean, this is a this is grand cosmic adventure that I I'd never really seen before uh, in a comic. And over the years, I read all the Burn Run and bits and pieces, uh, and it, it it never disappointed. And, and to return to these stories recently and to read the omnibus. Uh, and other back I read some interviews with Byrne as well. well I'll throw some insights in from those as well but this is for me this is as good as it gets I mean 
I, I'd like to think Jack Kirby. I, I don't know. I don't know if he's, if he commented on Burns' run. If he had, I, I just haven't read it. But I, I'd like to think he was proud of what Burns did here because this is this is very much in 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 the sweep and, and epic scope of what Lee and Kirby did. And the, we're going to probably use the word big quite a bit here in words like epic and grandeur and so forth. But then Burns just he makes it his own. I mean, there's no denying this is Burns' Fantastic Four. And it's as thrilling to read now when I'm as I'm 42 years old as it was when I was, you know, 11 and 12. So I'm thrilled and honored, especially in Jamie's name, to be discussing this. Mr. Deemer. So I uh, I missed all this when when I was reading comics. Like I I didn't start getting comics regularly until about 87 or 88, um, and I had you know a few scattered issues of of stuff from before that so this was you know over and done with basically by the time i was reading comics um but of course in you know 1992 i was working at a comic book store with jamie so um it wasn't long before i was hearing the name john Byrne over and over and over again which of course at that time then it was all about next men right so i was reading next men and fell in love with john Byrne, um and then as uh, when the year 2000 rolled around and they started, Marvel started doing these visionary trade paperbacks, I was finally able to pick, in 2001, the first FF Visionaries volume came out. And so I finally got it because Jamie had been telling me for years and years that I should read this, right? Uh, and so I did. And then I got, I have six volumes of Fantastic Four Visionaries by John Byrne. I think there's one or two more that I never picked up, which is uh, something I'm going to have to rectify. But so as they came out, I, I picked them up and I read them. Um, and so that, I think the last one I have was like 2006. So it's been almost 10 years now since I've read these. So I'm not going to be quite as up on the material as you guys are. Um, but obviously it's, it's just awesome. And, uh, and, and so I was very happy to finally be able to read them. And also at the same time I was reading the, uh, burn X-Men stuff, which is still basically the best X-Men that's ever been done in my opinion. Um, yeah, I mean, it took me a while after knowing Jamie to get to read them, but I have, and, and I'm very, very happy that I did. And I think, you, Chris, you know, you just said that you think Jack Kirby would probably be proud. I think what Jack and Stan did with the first 100 issues of Fantastic Four, and Peter has said this in the past, is that they they basically created the Marvel Universe in those 100 issues. Absolutely. You know, pretty much all the core tenets of, of everything Marvel is in those issues somewhere, right? I think what Byrne did was he then expanded the Marvel Universe and he set the stage for, you know, a whole nother generation. And and some of these pieces are still, I mean, I'm reading the Fantastic Four right now and they're still, you know, they're talking about Malice and how Malice is back and, and Sue's having to fight back Malice. Well, Malice came out of these issues, right? That was a burn thing, right? And, uh, and then the other thing that they have established that people have been played with in the last couple of years is that basically maybe you could say that the most powerful person in the entire Marvel universe is Sue. And when you just said in your introduction, right, Burn sort of made her the most powerful member of the team. Well, now it's gone beyond that where she's just not to be, uh, you know, overlooked. Um, so I think it's very interesting. The, the building blocks that Byrne laid down are still being played with today. Here, here, my friend. Pants, have we plunged into the checklist? Uh, soldier on. <laughs> are you all, I'm a sleepy. You plunge, up, plunge away? Yeah, that, that too. <laughs> uh, the pants plunger. All right, now. <laughs> now, as we mentioned, we're going to just, just kind of give an overview of the issues leading up to burn because I don't want to shortchange uh, the issues in between 200 and 232. A, burn was involved in a lot of those, and B, you've got creators like Marv Wolfman and, and Doug Munch and Bill Sienkiewicz and Keith Pollard and uh, the always great uh, Joe Sinnott. So it's not like we're talking about you know third stringers here. So in, the, in those early after we, 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 we in our Bronze Age episode, we talked about how the FF in quotes finally beat Doctor Doom, and in that epic. Uh, anniversary issue and doom is rendered mad by the reflection of his own face many times over and he's seemingly rendered insane and uh zorba who is the he was the son of the former king of latveria wasn't he adam uh, the brother i think oh rodolfo yeah, who king was, rodolfo. been killed yeah. yeah so he 
he takes control, and, and, you, and you, you get the impression that Zorba is going to bring you know, democratic reform to Latveria. That's not going to work out. We'll return to that later. So the FF come back home. Now, these stories are all being read by, read, read, excuse me, written by Marv Wolfman. You have to remember, this is the very late 1970s. Wolfman's already done or is actually finishing his legendary Tomb of Dracula run uh, for Marvel, which one of the, for me is one of the best titles of the Bronze Age. And he's soon going to be moving to Noon Teen Titans, which we all know how important that is. And then a few more years, of course, Adam, Crisis on Infinite Earths. <laughs> so this is, we're not, this is no slouch here in the writing department. Now, in uh, issue 201, 202, uh, the team returns from Latveria, and they're attacked by the defense of their own headquarters, the Baxter Building. And issue 201, just for those who enjoy these types of uh, images, which you often get in, in, in team books like this, there is a diagram, an updated diagram in the Baxter Building. That kind of stuff is always fun, those kinds of supplements oh, yeah. uh, in, in a comic. Now, issue 202, uh, John Buscema is penciling, the, the, the legendary artist, and – if we find out that Quasimodo is he called the living computer, Adam Quasimodo? Um, I don't know if he's called that, but it's it's it, it, it describes what yeah. he is, right? Yeah. He has stolen the Baxter Building, and he wants to hijack the FF's uh, rocket plane or ship because he has this yearning to travel to the stars. And uh, Iron Man shows up to help the FF in this. Now, Adam, just a quick background on Quasimodo. What was um. His origin. Uh, well, uh, his name is an abbreviation for quasi motivational uh, destruct organism. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, 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 I just. Deemer, I, this is why we need the video right now. <laughs> oh my God, yes. Go ahead, go ahead. Just the looks on your faces is like, <laughs> I shame myself yet again. Uh, so he began as a, uh, just this. Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, Cecil, com- this, this non-mobile uh, computer unit. He was uh, mm. rooted to the floor, and he was invented by the Mad Thinker. Okay. And uh, I think he, he battled the Silver Surfer once or twice, and, uh, well, he eventually managed to design for himself this uh, humanoid body, so he's able to move around. So, you know, having begun his life as this uh, immobile uh, f- computer unit, uh, one understands why he wants to move around not only on the, the planet of his birth, but to get out into the stars as well. Well put, sir. Thank you very much. Now, the Baxter Building, just a quick aside about the Baxter Building. Throughout the FF's history, the Baxter Building in many ways is almost a character in itself. And they've done so sure. much with, with that headquarters. Um, and, and, and we'll talk about how, how what Byrne will actually do with the Baxter Building uh, during his run. Now, uh, starting with issue 204, I think, is the, is the centerpiece of – the Marv Wolfman era of FF, and I know some people online, the forums, have talked about this era, cause, and it's it's kind of overlooked, but it's actually, I think, a very important and, and a very captivating story. Uh, first of all, the scrolls return, which is never good, <laughs> and it turns out there the scrolls are in a war with uh, the planet Xandar, which we all know is the home of the Nova Corps, which, of course, people have maybe more familiar with that because of the Guardians of the Galaxy film. And is this the first appearance of Queen Andorra? Of the Xandarians, or no? I wasn't sure. Uh, either here or in, or in uh, Nova. In Nova, yeah, because uh, Marv Wolfman's drawing. Right. He used to write Nova. So right. He's drawing so, on a lot of the things he yeah. wanted to do in that series but wasn't able to finish. Right. So Nova was coming out in the – I think the mid-'70s Nova came out, if I remember correctly. This, or, according to comic book DB, is the first appearance of Adora of Xandar. Thank you, sir. So the Fantastic Four get caught in the middle of this, and the scrolls zap them with an aging ray. And Wolfman will then carry this out for the next several issues. The, the FF are literally slowly dying because I think it says the scroll says in like three days or something like that that they, they would age to the point of death. So not only are they trying to help uh, Xandar, but they're also becoming protected by the fact that we have to somehow prevent ourselves from aging and dying in the next, seven, in the next uh, 72 hours basically. So there's that, that drama there. Now, issue 208 – again, this is, a, this is a lot larger sort of overarching arc here. We have the, the, a being called the Sphinx who shows up, and it turns out he's an immortal being from ancient Egypt who found some jewel or talisman. Yeah, the Ka Stone. Go ahead, Murd. Fire away. Yeah. Well, yeah, he was actually – his origin is biblical actually. He's uh, described as the, the magician in the court of Pharaoh who was bested by Moses when Moses right, came yeah. to request that, that the Israelites be set free. He's the one whose uh, staff was turned into a snake, and then Moses turned his staff into a snake, and it ate the other guy's snake. So Anath Namut <laughs> was his name, and he was this magician, and he was exiled from the court of the Pharaoh after that, went on this long trek across the Egyptian desert until he found a temple where this mystic stone was kept, and that's how he became the Sphinx. Now, 
in these stories, we should give a little bit more background. Nova actually appears, Richard mm-hmm. Ryder, and he's part of a team called the New Champions. Right, the Champions of Xandar. Yes, and these are different – they're not all Xandarians though, right? Some of them are, some of them but are. some okay. are, are Earthlings, like a couple of people that uh, Nova encountered during his career as a solo crime fighter. A couple of his fellow vigilantes and at least one bad guy, Diamond Head. That's right. I thought he was a villain, yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of a way for Wolfman to bring in characters that he had been working on uh, in the Nova book. Mm-hmm. And – it turns out that – and that, here's, here's Wolfen bringing another one of his characters from Tomb of Dracula, Dr. Sun, mm-hmm. one of my favorite goofy villains, the disembodied brain mm-hmm. floating in a, you know, like a glass uh, container who is this malevolent presence who was an enemy of Dracula in the Tomb of Dracula series. And both he, Dr. Sun and the Sphinx want to exploit the living computers, as they're called, of Xandar for their, for their own uh, malevolent purposes. And the Sphinx becomes this incredibly powerful – Entity that they they can't stop and and he's on a, on a you know a path of destruction, and the FF realized the only entity that can defeat the Sphinx is Galactus. So <laughs> the FF now go on a search, starting issue two eight to find Galactus to try to recruit him to fight the Sphinx. Now Adam will recall how the FF dealt with Galactus prior to this issue. Do you remember that having to do with the Impossible Man? Oh, Just refresh right, the right. listeners' memory um, on that one. Well, uh, the Impossible Man showed up <laughs> and uh, invited Galactus to consume the planet Pop-Up, which is his home planet, because all those people had kind of evolved into this big, uh, gloomy hive mind. They didn't have individual thoughts or emotions. The, the Impossible Man was the only one of his race who right. did, and he was a mutant. It's the only reason he had those uh, capabilities. And uh, so the rest of the pop upian race kind of just wanted to die. So uh, Galactus did them a solid and ate them. Uh, but then he developed a case of cosmic indigestion Indeed. that uh, damn near killed him. Yep. And you think – I mean they give the impression that on that issue – we discussed this in our previous episode on the Bronze Age that Galactus had been consumed you know, or he was killed because he devoured Papa. But now, of course, they're going to explain uh, that is not actually what happened. Now – so they go on the hunt uh, for Galactus. Now, issue 209 is important for the purposes of our, our discussion here because this is the first time Byrne is penciling the Fantastic Four. He's not scripting. Uh, that Wolfman's handling the script, but he's penciling and, and, and said it's – and I think what's interesting here from an artistic perspective, we're all accustomed to let's, – let's put it in quotes – the John Byrne style. And Byrne usually either inks himself or we think of him being inked by Terry Austin from his legendary X-Men run. When you look at Byrne being penciled by Joe Sinnott, some people might be shocked. I mean, it's wonderful arc. It's Joe Sinnott was one of the great inkers of the Marvel Age, but it, it's not the John Byrne style I think people are accustomed to. Is it a little more? Is it a little more like Marvel House style or something? I, I would, I would agree. I would agree with that, Brian, because Sinnott inked the Fantastic Four for years, and he provided sort of a visual continuity for the book because he's such a master inker. And I think you see that uh, in these early issues. It's, it's wonderful art, but it's, it's just it's just to make people aware, it's very different. Mm-hmm. From when we think of John Byrne art, yeah. basically. And I don't think you see a John Byrne FF cover till issue 211. So I think that this uh, 209, I believe, is uh, penciled. Uh, yeah, the cover was penciled by uh, looks like Keith Pollard. Because well, Pollard had been on the book for some time. Right, I guess they might have yeah. like worked ahead a little bit. And then the issue um, 210, uh, looks like the cover artist is uh, Dan Crespi, I believe. Now, uh, an important fun footnote about issue 209 – is the first appearance of Herbie <laughs> the Robot. <laughs> I laughed. Now, really? let's, uh, let's remind people what Herbie stands for. Humanoid Experimental Robot B-Type Integrated Electronics. And some listeners are not familiar with the actual origin of Herbie, which takes place in the multimedia world of the Fantastic Four. And they actually poke fun at it in the story here, which is a lot of fun. Yeah, he's called a refugee from a Saturday morning cartoon show multiple times. Right, because as we know from <laughs> the 70s, you had you had you first had the FF com- cartoon in the '60s, and then you had a second FF cartoon in the 1970s. But I, I, if I remember correctly, the Human Torch had already been optioned out for some other project, so they couldn't use them in the cartoon. I think the urban legend was they thought kids would set themselves on fire. That, I don't think that's actually true. I think it was a contractual matter. Right. We've sufficiently debunked yeah. that now. And so they had to create a fourth member for the team. So they came up with this robot. And in the comic, you know, there's in the omnibus here, if you're looking at the omnibus, page 58, the torch, you know, Snickerson says, well, I was out of town the day the contracts needed to be signed. <laughs> so A little, little meta there, yeah. huh? Yeah, the look on his face as he says it, too. Yeah, and, 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 great and, little burn facial expressions. Yep. 
and Ben t- takes an instant antipathy towards uh, Herbie, which they kind of maintain throughout. But it, it, Reed creates the robot in the context of the story. So when he's when he's across the galaxy away from the Baxter Building, Herbie allows him to have instant access to the Baxter Building's you know you know giant computer systems essentially. Hmm. So Herbie's going to play a very kind of an important role actually. Uh, in some of these uh, subsequent stories. <laughs> the, the, the big plot point in this issue, 209, is that the FF find Galactus, and he offers to aid them in their quest against the Sphinx, but of course, there's a caveat. Of course. You'll recall going back to the Silver Age, Galactus had pledged never to devour the Earth, and he says to Reed, well, if you release me from my pledge, I'll help you. And Reed, and Ben's saying, you know, you know Stretcho, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, don't worry, old friend, I have, you know, I have a plan. It's, it's all going to be all right. So they they recruit Galactus. Now, along the, around the same time, they introduce another character to be very important in the Burn era, which is Tyros, later known as Terax the Tamer. And he first appears in issue 211. I should mention, by the way, the FF are still aging throughout all of this. That, that's still happening where they're, they're starting to get weaker. They're having a harder time manipulating their powers. They reveal that Sue's parents died young, so there's a concern she's going to age and die first because of her, her genes. So Wolfman's really doing a nice job carrying through this, this very captivating uh, you know, subplot. And Tyros rules this – he's like a petty dictator of this city-state on this planet. I, th- this is the time period where, where Galactus recruits him as, as his herald, right? Right. Yeah, OK. And Murd, why don't you explain just quickly what Terax's powers are when he's transformed by the power cosmic. OK. So uh, by, this is going to be the fourth herald uh, if you don't count the Asgardian destroyer drone, which uh, Galactus did employ as a herald for a time. Well, there was Silver Surfer, right. Air, Airwalker, mm-hmm. and oh. Fire Lord. Right. Well, yeah. well, I guess fifth if you count the Airwalker he robot. robot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, there, there was a flesh and blood Airwalker for a time. That's right. He died and Galactus out of sentiment uh, created an – automaton based on his <laughs> body and mind uh but so he's had uh, silver surfer air walker and fire lord water air fire so he's kind of self-consciously going on the uh, the classic rosicrucian elements here so he's decided <laughs> okay we need a fourth to represent earth and he makes uh, also consciously decides he's going to select somebody who's a little more ruthless and uh, less sentimental than his past heralds. He doesn't want this his new herald forming attachments to planets that Galactus might right. want to consume. So he uh, sends uh, the Fantastic Four down to this planet. We later learn it's called Burge, and uh, the ruler of a uh, of the city state of Lanlac is uh, this <laughs> Tyros the Terrible, uh, who has some latent uh, geokinetic powers of his own, which he apparently doesn't even know about. Um, but uh, Galactus, then, uh, after the Fantastic Four have, uh, you know, even in their weakened, a superannuated state, they're able to uh, take Tyros down fairly easily, have him cowering at their boots. Once they've tamed the tamer, uh, Galactus then steps in and uh, makes uh, Tyros the offer he can't refuse to be empowered with the, the power cosmic and become the, the latest in a line of Galactus. And he heroes. gives him this, like, cosmic axe, axe and he can, he can control. Earth, Earth, yeah. rocks, and, and he looks rock-like, obviously. His yes, appearance exactly. And, kind of uh, dark side-ish. Yes, yeah. that's a good point. So he recruits T- Tyrus, now renamed Terax, and in issue 213 – I want to say one thing please, about sir, 212. Please, So reading this book, get to, pay, get to um, issue 212, and on page 124 and 125 is an absolutely fantastically beautiful two-page splash – of the Sphinx, oh yeah, looking over you know Egypt and pyramids, like he's, he's trying to recreate ancient Egypt. Yeah, that page I stared at for many many minutes. That's when the first time in this book. Now the other page, everything before is fine. It looks nice, like like you all said. It's very house style ish. Yeah. It doesn't look like burn that I would see later. Right. But this page caught my attention as the first time. I'm like wow. This is something fantastic. No, this, no is, this, is merely, this is merely a warm up, my friend. Yeah, and yeah. And, and and yes, and as it went on further, I, it just got better and better. But this page was my first gasp type moment. Outstanding. Now, in issue two thirteen, Galactus defeats the Sphinx, and actually, you know, the great shots of these two giant cosmic oh. beings slugging it out. That's another good one. And um, Galactus is—it's almost like he's offended that the Sphinx dare try to come to blows with him. And all of these to defeat him, but he condemns him to this eternal torture, 
where he must relive his entire existence. Because the Sphinx really almost wanted to die because he was trapped in immortality. Oh, more than almost. That was his um, His major motivation. He he wanted to be a conqueror before this. But now that he's got all this power, all he wants to do is use it to destroy everything and himself with it. And what Galactus does, he says, well, you know what I'm going to do to you? I'm going to make you relive your entire moral existence over and over and over again. So he puts him back in ancient Egypt. You know, before becomes the Sphinx, doomed to do this, experience the exact same lifetime with all its agonies over and over again. Galactus can be, you know, a real SOB sometimes. Now, but here's the problem of Reed released Galactus from his pledge, and Galactus, as he often says, hungers. And he wants to consume the Earth. Now, Uatu, the Watcher, Mm -hmm. has appeared. And Reed shows up with what he says is the uh, another version of the ultimate nullifier, which we'll recall is what, what they used to drive Galactus from Earth in the classic Galactus trilogy, FF issues 48 uh, through 50. And we find out that when Galactus leaves, saying, all right, I'll come back and devour the Earth in my own time, that Uatu once again, in that way only he can, has skirted around his pledge not to interfere, and he sort of telepathically masked Reed's intentions from Galactus. The ultimate nullifier is a fake. It's just something Reed made out of spare parts. It's not any, it doesn't have any power whatsoever. But Watu works with Reed to conceal that from Galactus, so Galactus uh, leaves the Earth, essentially. And then, and then there's some fun panels where Watu's talking about, oh, well, I didn't actually interfere, and he's explaining how we did it. And, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's fun stuff. Now, also, those first few issues, it was fun for me to read about Galactus doing something. I've always known of Galactus, and he's in the background and might see him do something once in a he's while. He's off on his world ship. But yeah. this was, was really something special for me to, to well, he was see some out. action yeah, and yeah. fighting. It, it, that was cool. And we have to remember, and Byrne explores this later, probably more than anyone else mm-hmm. had ever done so effectively. The way we perceive Galactus is only one way Galactus appears. Because Galactus, while well, he was a man before the Big Bang, the planet Ta, was that where he was exactly. from? Exactly. Yeah. He was one of the last explorers of that old universe and and when the big bang happened and, and he was reformed by those cosmic forces into this force of nature essentially and when we, when we talk about the trial of reed richards later on where reed is put on trial by the shiar and burn does this great page where all the different alien races how they see galactus everyone sees it because galactus is not a man mm. in a different way which is just fascinating so issue 214 the problem is the ff are still aging mm. And by 214, they're geriatric and they're dying. They actually have to be placed in stasis chambers. Yep, that's, well, that's where uh, yeah. Ben and Sue were during yeah. the, issue, the events of this issue, well, number 213, then. Yeah. Breed had to stay out to help uh, well, figure out a way to stop Galactus. And, then he had, and since Johnny Storm wasn't with them when the scrolls aged them, it's now up to him to try to find a way to save them. Now, Wolfman uh, is exploring the fact, as does Burn later, that Johnny Storm it really has a confidence problem. For all his you know, whiz-bang, hot-shot, attitudes he often feels like he's not he's kind of like a, this second banana who really isn't really that helpful to the team and reed saying look it's up to you you have you have to figure out a way to do this and the book is about johnny not only trying to overcome the challenge of, of saving his his family but also overcoming his own lack of confidence and in in both cases he prevails and uh he's able to reverse engineer with with reed's help the scroll uh aging uh gun and the FF are restored to, to youth, and in fact, Reed mentions that we're even more youthful and vigorous than ever before, which is a nice way to get around, you know, the, the lapse of time. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, and Johnny's confidence, you know, gets a big boost from that. So that ends a, a, a kind of a it's an often overlooked arc in FF history, but it's, it's actually a pretty important one in, in terms of uh, what happens. Adam, you want to say something? Go yeah. ahead. No, it's like a well, it's a Fantastic Four space opera. Well put. Yeah. yeah, it's like the, the the whole conflict between the Skrulls and the Xandar the Zandarians to start right. it off, and then you know, the bringing in Galactus and a new herald of Galactus in the middle of that, and then everything comes back down to earth in the end, and, and so with the whole continuing thread of the the aging ray to, to tie the whole thing together, yeah. time running out for the team, and Johnny coming through in the end to. Yeah, so it's so it gave Wolfman a somewhat self indulgent uh, indulgent chance to uh, tie off loose ends from his Nova, the Human Rocket series, and even Doctor Sun from Tomb of Dragon. <laughs> yeah, so. for real. Now, uh, two seventeen by Herbie betrayed. All right, we find out that Doctor Sun, the disembodied floating brain, has got into the FF's computer systems and has possessed Herbie, and Herbie starts to attack and try to murder all of the FF. 
And it turns out in the end that Herbie is able to regain, let's say, his, its faculties because Dr. Sun is now in all the FF's computers. And Herbie actually commits suicide and destroys itself to protect the FF. And, you know, Reed's saying, oh, you know, Ben, he's just a computer. And Ben's saying, I don't know, Stretcho. I think he may have, you know, really felt something for us. And he, he, he sacrificed you know, himself for us. Uh, this issue also has an appearance by the Dazzler. That was cool. Um, Johnny Storm goes out in the town in vintage 1979 okay. outfit. Wide collar, collar oh, yeah. three necklaces, shirt halfway open. Yeah, yeah. God, it's fantastic. So, I could uh, hear, you know, baby, <laughs> in the background of that club. You can picture him walking down the street, you know, to staying alive like in the beginning of uh, Saturday Night Fever. <laughs> but, um, so you have a fun little – where he meets the – and like anybody, he's totally blown away by how beautiful the Dazzler is and how powerful her voice is and so forth. You gotta love the Dazzler's disco outfit, by the way. Yes, you do. Um, issue two eighteen, a fun, frightful four. One of the perennial adversaries of the Fantastic Four. They actually use the Trapster, no longer christened Pace Pot Pete by this point, to impersonate Spider Man to infiltrate uh, the Baxter Building, and ultimately the frightful four are defeated. There's a fun sequence at the end where they're mocking the Trapster for his old name, and they so intimidate him that the Trapster actually faints uh, in the presence of the thing. So it's just a fun story. Oh, written the suction, by uh, the suction cups didn't give it away at all. <laughs> now, one of your favorites, uh, Chris, Bill Mantlo, actually stepped yes. in as temporary scripter of the FF, which he would do often in uh, many stories in this time period. Now, uh, issues two twenty two twenty one are very important for the purposes of this episode. The spotlight is now Burn writes and pencils the Fantastic Four for the first time. Just these two issues. I think this was supposed to be some kind of promotional comic. Mm -hmm, it was that didn't pan out. So they they folded it into. Uh, the the actual title. Mer, do you remember what that promotion was for? I didn't. I, I do not. Here, hold on, it's, it, I think it's right in here. Well, I want to say Coca Cola. I think it just says a promotional comment. Yeah. Does it? Yep. Yep. It's in the omnibus. It doesn't say yeah. which. Regardless, uh, just for what? Uh, it's Byrne now. You know, we're flexing his his, his writing chops, and it, it's, just, it's just a fun story. The FF contend with a worldwide blackout due to an alien presence at the North Pole, where there's this alien ship where these aliens got caught on Earth and then they can't leave. And the FF helped them, you know, go, go, go on their way and kind of restore the balance of things. Now, issues 222 to 231, this is the, the Doug Munch era of uh, Fantastic Four. And uh, the great uh, Bill Sienkiewicz is penciling here. I had no idea Sienkiewicz penciled Fantastic Four. For yep. a whole year. For a whole year. I mean, yeah. actually, I think he did, I think, also two... It's so one of the issues just we – I think yeah. it was like issue 219. 219. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, it was Munk and yeah. uh, Sienkiewicz on that too. Munk, I'm sorry. I mispronounced yeah. it. I apologize. Fantastic, it's Fantastic Four versus Giganto again, you know, the big yeah. whale monster. Oh, I think it. it is Munch. We, we interviewed him. Yeah, yeah, that's Munch. It's oh, Munch. On right is Munch? Okay. Yeah. I'll take my quarter out of the uh, can then. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, of course, you know, there's new mutants and some other things. But I never knew he worked on the Fantastic Four. Well, what's one? interesting about these – it's a good point, Pants, is that – when we think of Sienkiewicz's style, you think of New Mutants, you think of Moon Knight, right? You think, right, you right. think of all the great work. Yeah. And you see how much his style changed from these FF stories to, let's call it the more signature Sienkiewicz style, of, of, which was very famous in the, in the, in the 1980s. Um, now, this run is fun. Nothing really earth-shaking happens in it. Um, you have some stuff with the Salem Seven that mm -hmm. Adam's talked about before. Agatha Harkness. You want to go on about that? The Adam, possession sorry. of Franklin Richards, where uh, Agatha Harkness's uh, renegade son Nicholas Scratch, who's the devil, basically. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> old Nick or old Scratch are two uh, pseudonyms for the devil. So this guy of uh, this member of this hidden tribe of uh, magic users, witch folk, basically in uh, New Salem, Colorado, uh, he takes over the body of Franklin Richards, and it's up to the FF to uh, drive him out, exercise him. And to help them with that is one of uh, Doug, uh, we'll say Munch's uh, own characters, uh, Gabriel the Devil Hunter, whom we mentioned in our um, Spotlight on Marvel Monsters a while That's ago. That's right. He, what did he appear in Marvel premiere Spotlight, one of those books, I think? Uh, Haunt of Horrors. Haunt of Horror, okay. He, he might have appeared somewhere else, okay. too, but uh, uh, it was one of Marvel's horror magazines. And he was kind of like a two-fisted exorcist character. <laughs> So Munch, uh, in a self-indulgent move there also just uh, took it. Oh, and speaking of self-indulgence, there was also a, a quick story featuring the Shogun Warriors. That's right. Yeah, because uh, Munch, Munch also wrote that book. He did. Herb Trimpey doing the art. Mm -hmm. And it was canceled a mere four months before Fantastic Four number 226, which is when that story happened. And he kind of used this FF story to kind of resolve the Shogun Warriors arc essentially. I think they, their armor is destroyed I believe in the, in the end of this story if I remember correctly. All right. Who had Shogun Warriors as a kid? Anybody? I, I had a couple. Not. You had, I had wow. a couple. Um, smaller ones. 
Okay. Not, not the large scale ones, but I think Jamie might have had some of them. I know we've mm-hmm. talked about that. Yeah. I, I had the Godzilla, of course, from the Shogun Warriors <laughs> line, which we've talked about. Um, Wonderful. Go ahead, Adam. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, in issue number 228, a new wrinkle uh, discovered in Franklin Richards' powers. Uh, the, it manifests itself as the ego spawn, uh, <laughs> where uh, Franklin's uh, feelings of resentment toward and uh, envy of uh, Johnny, where uh, Johnny goes running off to, to, to go on a date with a, a girl instead of uh, playing with Franklin, as he promised. Uh, that leads Franklin's uh, psionic powers to lash out. And reach out into the surrounding area, and uh, possesses um, a, a local uh, a local meathead named Franco Berardi, <laughs> uh, who was uh, who is out uh, with his girl at the same place where Johnny and his date are, and uh, he's jealous of Johnny Storm because his girlfriend is uh, kind of uh, mooning over him a little bit, and uh, so uh, Franklin Richards' uh, own uh, feelings toward Johnny link up with uh, this guy's feelings, and uh, he is, so he becomes this being called the Ego Spawn. In which uh, his, he's acting on his own negative feelings as well as Franklin's, and uh, he attacks the, the human torch. Adam, I'm glad you brought that up because one thing we should constantly re- remind people of, including ourselves, is that all these creators usually return to the fact that Franklin Richards is the most powerful being or one of the most powerful beings in the Marvel Universe. And in these earlier stories, there's all these l- moments where they start to explore how powerful – how really powerful is this kid? And they, they give you these insights into just – Almost the the sheer infinite magnitude of his power, um, and of course that's explore. Burn will explore that very much as well, and then past Burn, they they keep looking into you know think of the Future Foundation, everything that's going on recently. Um, very important character. Mm-hmm. Any other comments you want to make on the, the Munch run, or um, just one more? Sure. Uh, issue number two thirty one. Uh, Munch tried to introduce a new member of uh, the uh, Negative Zones Most Wanted. You know, so often we see Annihilus and Blastar. Blastar yep. He introduced a character called Stigor the Night Lord, and um, uh, a character that unfortunately did not uh, take. Um, he, I guess he just wanted somebody other than those two in the negative zone for the FF right. or other characters to go up against. But uh, one of my favorite panels in this omnibus actually is um, one of the early issues of the Into the Negative Zone story, which we'll talk about a little yes. later. Um, we get to see a, a couple of quick uh, headshots like up on a, a monitor in the, the Fantastic Force headquarters of uh, Blastar and Annihilus and also Stigor. And it's John Byrne's rendering of a Bill Sienkiewicz character design. You know, just wow. a, a character that was uh, created by Sienkiewicz's signature, you know, slashing lines and jagged angles and extraneous shapes done up in uh, Byrne's very – comparatively very clean style. It was just kind of fun to see. Also shows Byrne was doing his homework very much so. Yeah. Because that's a one-off character basically. So props for that. And that I believe was the first and only appearance. Of Stigor. Stigor, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I believe you are right. Now the drum roll – we, an intake of anticipation <laughs> in our breath, the full burn era of the Fantastic Four. All right, and I have a quote right. from oh, uh, again Modern Masters Volume Seven from the wonderful uh, Tomorrow's book uh, on John. That whole series, but by the way, mo- the Modern Masters series by Tomorrow's. I can't praise that series enough. And, we and, have quite a lot of them yeah, in our and, studio yeah, here on our shelf. And, uh, Eric Noel Wellington has worked on a lot of these books. It's, it's it's wonder, they're wonderful, in-depth explorations of a, a lot of great living comic book creators and, and, and just their, their take on their work, and, and it, it's, it's wonderful. So a quote from Volume 7 that they interview Byrne about his whole career, and they ask him about the Fantastic Four, and he just says, you know, how did you feel about it? He said, he said great, it's probably my best time you know, in, in comics. And I, I take that to heart because when I read these stories, it, you, it, they exude how much passion and fun he was having, at least as my interpretation of them, as he was creating these stories. Now, his first issue where he's both writer and artist and inker. He's not just penciling. And, and when, you, when you talk about the burn style, it, boy, is it, is it on display in these stories. Well, not, So he inked this issue 232 as well? He, 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 uh, he oh, no. Not. This one was oh, I'm your sorry. name or whatever. I apologize. But yeah. the next one, I think after no, 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 that. What's, what's the inker's all... name? Bjorn Hain. No, it is John Byrne. It's an anagram of his name. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> it's no, it's I Byrne. did yeah. not know that. Yeah. <laughs> so what's, what's interesting about that um, is when, <laughs> you know, and this is something for Pants' area of expertise, is when somebody inks their own stuff, they get to keep all the pages. Oh, yeah. Right. No, the, the, I, I don't right, know. Yeah. I don't know how it worked back in, in this day, but 
generally speaking in today's time, if you have an actual physical piece of art that somebody penciled and then somebody else inked over it, two different people, usually it's two-thirds of the original art goes back to the penciler, one-third to the inker, generally. But yeah, now, I don't know how it worked in this, but in this well, era... I can tell you how it worked in because... Walter Simonson still has every single page he's ever done, except for two that he personally traded to another artist yeah. of his. Uh, he because he never had to give any of it up because he always inks okay, his own that, stuff. That's true. That's true. So I don't know if John Byrne has sold all of his pages or if he's sitting on a bunch of them waiting or what. I don't know what the art market is like, but uh, well, yeah, quite it's just a, an interesting tidbit. Quite a lot of them are in the marketplace. I'm, I'm sure some are from collections somewhere that we don't know about them, mm-hmm. but. Uh, yeah, again, like I mentioned before, very, very desired, very sought after art, art artwork. Uh, he's just one of those handful of people, along with like, like Jack Kirby and like John P. Summer, would have like their pages, boom, Gil Kane. It just their name alone is, is drawn well, to deservedly it. so. Ex- exactly. I mean. Yeah. So let me uh, while we're talking about John Byrne artwork in general on Fantastic Four, uh, one of the other. So we've compared. Like perhaps the two most seminal runs on Fantastic Four being the Stanley and Kirby, and then the John Byrne run. Well, the other way that that Byrne um, sort of follows in the footsteps, and, and depending on your opinion, might even surpass Jack Kirby, is the ability to draw insane and incredible machines. Right, Jack. Kirby, that was one of Jack Kirby's sort of signatures. He could draw these zany, you know cosmic machines or whatever well burn every time you're in reed's laboratory or some other place i mean i can't the number of lines alone that are on like one machine you think how could he possibly do a whole comic a month shouldn't it have taken him a month just to draw that panel you know well i think that's a good point brian it's very much in keeping with burn paying tribute to the spirit of kirby in these books because you're right i mean when you think of Jack Kirby artwork, one of the signature aspects of his artwork is those just wild pieces of, of let's you know technology he would create for the Marvel Universe and, and other books he was doing. And, and burned. I mean, there's there's for example, uh, in issue two fifty three in the omnibus is on page eight oh seven the the opening title quest, and they show this magnificent uh, alien craft. Uh, uh, navigating through the negative zone, and, and the way this is very much insp- influenced by Kirby, you, it's almost like it's popping out of the, out of the page at you, and uh, it's it's breathtaking, and it's very much in keeping with that that sort of that epic cosmic style uh, of the Fantastic Four. I'm already getting chills. <laughs> now, issue two thirty two. Uh, this is begins Burns Run. He now is, he runs through issue two ninety three. So that's from 1981 to 1986. For, as we all know, for, especially in this day and age where people are often on books, you know, constantly rotating often, that's a hell of a run, especially when he's writing and penciling and inking mm-hmm. the book simultaneously. So yeah. it's quite an achievement. And then if, if my memory is correct, he comes off of this to the Man of Steel miniseries, more uh, yes. or less. He, he then switches over to do yeah. Superman, yep. Wow. And, the, and the, that's, yeah, the mid-'80s. Yeah, I mean, remember, we have to mention that Byrne often has a reputation as being sort of the guy they bring in to, I don't know if save or maybe revive, right? Characters they feel need to be given some, you know, more steam in their strides. Revitalize? Or revitalize, mm-hmm. even better word. Thank you, sir. Fix it, man. Yeah. I mean, we, we've seen that with, he did that with Wonder Woman. They brought him for Wonder yeah. Woman, Fantastic Four, Superman, Spider Man. Uh, sp- what we, Spidey? Spider Man Chapter One. Oh, right. Oh, uh, yeah, I don't. Yeah, think of that one fondly. That but one didn't work out. All that's that why well, I, didn't, I didn't remember what you were talking about. It was for the same purpose. That yeah. It was, uh, yeah. I think they had, they brought him in in more recent years on Doom Patrol, uh, the Demon. Uh, he's you know yeah. that's that's part of his rep as a creator. But, West uh, Coast uh, Avengers. You know. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. As, as far as cover dates go, FF two ninety three cover dated August nineteen eighty six, October eighty six cover date of a uh, match number one. Okay. So well, well yeah. Said. Now, in 232, we have an appearance of a, of a – I don't know if you call him a classic, but he's definitely a, one of the FF's rogues gallery, Diablo. Adam, the alchemist. Please. Uh, see. Uh, <laughs> son of a – yeah, the indolent son of a Spanish nobleman. Um, 
Yeah, there's his origin story is a varied. Uh, he so he's he's quite a bit. He, he's very old. He's not. Uh, he wasn't born in the 20th century. Right. But whether he's like a uh, hundred years old or five hundred years old is not quite clear. You know, there have been different accounts. But uh, he was locked by angry villagers in a tomb underneath his castle, along with a whole bunch of his uh, notebooks and some of his powders and potions and equipment. And many years later, when the Fantastic Four happened to be in the neighborhood, he was able to mind control using some of his uh, alchemical whammies uh, the thing into ripping open. <laughs> In his tomb, and he got out, and he's been uh, causing mischief throughout the world, and usually clashing, clashing with the Fantastic Four ever since. His real name is Esteban Diablo. I knew you'd do that. I couldn't wait for it. <laughs> Excellent. Now, in this story, uh, Doctor Strange is called in to actually help the FF. Because remember, Reed Richards is not comfortable dealing with magic or anything having to do with that's, let's say, non-science. Um, that's something Mark uh, Wade will, will pursue magnificently when we get to the oh, 2000s. Unthinkable. Oh. So uh, the other interesting part of the story is right away Byrne establishes I'm going to be doing different things with Susan Richards. She gets a new haircut. Remember, it's the 80s. A lot of women got their hair chopped in the mm-hmm. 1980s. You know, shorter hairstyles were in. So Byrne you know, has Sue go to the hairdresser, and her long tresses are, are out of the picture. Mm-hmm. And uh, even deeper than that, uh, he starts monkeying with her powers almost immediately. Because yes. uh, you know well, what Diablo does to the FF in this issue is send these uh, out, these uh, elemental beings after right. them, made of living fire and what and so forth. Uh, so Sue is attacked by a living dirt being, and uh, mm-hmm. she's in, she's at the hairdresser's getting her new haircut as right. this happens. But uh, almost accidentally, like uh, out of desperation to save herself from this thing, she uses her power in a way she never has before. Just creates this uh, shaft of invisible force to yes. propel herself out. Out of the hair salon yep. to save her life, and she then proceeds to create a little invisible chair for herself, yep. and he propels herself along uh, to uh, get back to the Baxter Building yep. as quickly as possible. So here in this first burn ongoing issue, Sue is already finding new, uh, more effective ways to use her power beyond just making herself invisible and putting force fields around herself. Well put, sir. And we have to remember that as, as well with burn, and then afterwards, just I mean. We're already a long way from Sue Storm, the damsel in distress, only really a Silver Age who basically would be invisible, and that was about it. I mean, now her, her, she has a force field. She, it's, it can be a containment field. It can be a weapon. I mean, they're really going to start to explore both Burn and the creators after him just how powerful she really is. Uh, issue 233, I, I always thought it was a fun, kind of idiosyncratic story for the Fantastic Four. The Human Church versus Hammerhead, one of Spider Man's rogues. And in this story, uh, you kind of get the sense Byrne is you know, kind of getting his feet wet, kind of like these fun kind of one-off type stories. And uh, an, old, an old childhood bully from Johnny's uh, youth is going to go to the uh, electric chair, and he writes uh, Johnny a letter saying, you know, look, I, I've done a lot of terrible things in my life, but I, I was not guilty of the crime I'm being executed for. And Johnny decides to take up this guy's cause to try to find out you know, what actually happened. And that brings him into contact with Hammerhead, and they end up in a fight. Hammerhead's wearing like an exoskeleton to enhance his strength. It's just, it's just a fun story. We're just focusing on the Human Torch yeah. and his powers and his personality. And there's a great touch at the end where Johnny visits the the now executed criminal's mother to kind of comfort, and she basically says, "Yeah, he was no good." <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it, it's. It's one of those great moments in a comic where they kind of throw cold water in your face and say, "All right, this is not just your typical superhero comic. We're gonna we're gonna bring some sort of you know hard boiled reality to this a little bit." I always appreciate when they do things like that. Yeah, and any of you out there who are more DC fans and have read uh, Marv Wolfman's "Who Is Donna Troy" from the New Teen Titans, um, I, I'd, I'd compare this story to that. You know, it's uh, it's Johnny Storm. Uh, kind of getting to play detective a little bit. I mean, there is the fun slugfest with uh, Hammerhead, yeah. and a very unexpected villain. But, yes, uh, but there's there's also you know this he's uh, doing a favor for an old enemy here, right? Uh, a last request from this this childhood bully of his, and it's uh, and as you said, Chris, it's 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 just kind of showing the human side yeah. of, of this character. And uh, you know, usually Ben Grimm is the go to uh, pathetic figure of the right. Fantastic Four, but uh, Byrne seems to prefer to wring his pathos from the uh, angstful young Johnny Storm. This and is the first of a few stories where Johnny yeah. is really put through the ringer by Byrne. And Wolfman was doing some of that with with the whole aging uh, arc and Johnny's lack of confidence and his feeling that he's not really worthy of even being on the Fantastic Four. That he like at least like that second banana, but uh, Byrne d- does even more with that. And and on page three hundred eight, I love the use of the black and white as Johnny's reading the letter. There's six six panels where Johnny's thinking about what he's reading, and you see 
Oh yeah, the criminal going through something. It was it was really neat. Well, modern master John yeah. Byrne. We have to remember that Byrne is just coming off his, and I think it's fair to use this hyperbole, his legendary run on X Men. So he's, he's he's now at this point he is one of the hottest artists in the comic book business of that time, and he's taking all that he's he's done with the X Men, all that that the skills he developed, and he was he was a lot involved in a lot of co plotting by the end of his run on the X Men as well, and he's now he's now just firing on all cylinders on the Fantastic Four, and boy does it show. Now, Murd, I couldn't wait to hear your dissertation on this because issues two thirty four to two thirty five, ego the living planet. <laughs> you can't beat a planet with a beard. <laughs> and a huge gaping mouth and bushy eyebrows. Mm-hmm. Eyes the size of Iceland, yeah. <laughs> which, which fire destructive beams. <laughs> what is the origin, sir, of Ego the Living Planet? Uh, I'm not sure what his origin is. Um, he first appeared in an issue of Thor. Four, that's I know correct. That. He yeah, was, it was a survey creation, yep. of course. Oh, yeah. Um, and he's described as a living sentient bioverse, which means that he's this, this giant planet-sized organism, yep. and all the smaller organisms living on him are actually uh, just cells, just uh, just part of his uh, his his biomass, like an immune immunity defense system, and so forth mm-hmm. and so on. Yep, and he has a habit of uh, absorbing and assimilating uh, organic matter that happens to land on him. And in this case, ego, I think Galactus forced this space propulsion system into the planet to kind of drive Ego the, away from the known universe. And Ego's back and causing trouble, and the FF have to actually – the, the visuals here are eye-popping – to descend into the innards of Ego to try to find Ego's brain essentially to you know, drive Ego off again. Yeah, it's like a fantastic voyage. Yeah, and uh, what's great is Burn really gets into the fact that – you know. As they descend, the heat and pressure are so crushing that ultimately only the thing can continue to go on barely to deliver this – let's call it this Reed Richards thingamajig that's going <laughs> to sort of you know, zap the brain and, and, and uh, you know, drive e- – and does Ego blow up at the end of this? I uh, forgot. No, his uh, trajectory is just altered and okay. he, he flies into the sun. That's right. OK. So wasn't there another living planet that showed up later on? I feel like there was a second living planet. Id? I don't know. As good a guess as any. Better than most. Do you know how much I miss you? My God. (laughs) You know how much I miss Keiko? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, listeners, uh, Brian is fixated on my wife, but that's all right because, you know, I I, I take that as a a compliment. So, magnificent. Any other questions on Ego the Living Planet before we move on? Or comments. It does look like he breaks up in the sun, though. I feel like he, Ego returns, though. Oh, of course. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. 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 Like many times. Everybody else, but... Yeah. I, I think he was in a recent issue of Rocket Raccoon, actually. Okay. Well, it makes sense because it's such a far-out, fun mm-hmm. concept. I mean, For there's so sure. many different things you can do with Ego the Living Planet. I mean, it's, it's pure Kirby. All right, 236, I think, is an all-time classic fantastic This is a lot of fun to read. Oh, man. Now, this is the 20th anniversary issue. So the Fantastic Four has been around for 20 years, which seems like not so, so, such a long period of time considering where they are now in, in the present day. But uh, you know that was a big deal for a comic back then. Yeah. And uh, oh, this is a great. We talked about this a bit in our Do- Doctor Doom Spotlight. Mm-hmm. The story opens. It's got this almost this great Twilight Zone feel to it, where the FF are living a normal life in this bucolic Norman Rockwell type town Rockwell. called Littleville. And, you know, Ben has a bar and Alicia is, is his wife and Sue and Reed are living together in domestic bliss. Although Reed's having trouble at his college job where he's a professor, but from his tyrannical uh, dean of his department who's just not treating him w- uh, with full respect. Professor Vaughn. Uh, Professor Vaughn. Mm. And it comes out throughout the story that the FF are actually – have been sort of mind-wiped and – their bodies are in stasis in the actual 616 universe, and they're, the puppet master, using his radioactive clay, has created these miniature bodies for the FF. So Ben is human. He's not the thing in this, in this world. And Professor Vaughn is Doom, who has had his mind placed into this 
uh, this tyrannical dean of, of, of Reed's science department, this mm-hmm. university, yep. and use this technology to scramble Reed's mind in yes. his tiny so, avatar so that he's an intellectual inferior yes, so he, to Vaughn as Reed, There's great scenes where Reed is like – Reed's struggling because he thinks, you know, I should be able to do this, but I just can't, and he's, he's kind of in a daze. And, and there's great scenes where Doom as Vaughn is just you know, berating Reed, this hapless man on the faculty and so forth. And eventually it comes out that the FF come to their senses. They, they become self-aware again of who they actually are. And again, this is classic. Oh, yeah. there's a great two-page spurt. 384 of and yeah. 385 <sighs> of the omnibus. That was my next oh, yeah. wow moment. That's pure burn. Yeah. You see Doom, the real Doom, looming over Littleville. Because Littleville is, 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 is a model. It's a mock-up <laughs> on a table with all these miniaturized – and the, the other people in the town are all robots, right. essentially, who have all been programmed to have different personalities. And and, and and in particular, so 384 and 385 is the great splash page of Doom Looming. But you turn the next page, and it's a great picture of the FF being tied to the machine while Doom's, again, looming over the miniature model. Not only does that appeal to, to our, my artistic sense of, wow, that's just great. I love models. That would be just Cool. You want a little villain of your <laughs> I, own in your I toy do. room, don't Wouldn't you? Wouldn't that be awesome? I'm trying to figure that out in Legos, man. And one of the tragedies of the story, it's a classic FF plot device, is Ben doesn't want to go back yeah. because he's made of flesh. Alicia – is Alicia – can she see in she this? Can she see can see in see, right? Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and it is the real Alicia too. It's yeah. not a robot yeah. Alicia. No, no. She's been also – because yep. because the puppet master in his own warped way is trying to give his stepdaughter mm-hmm. the domestic bliss in this fantasy world he's created. I mean, the puppet master is is a warped, but a, uh, albeit a tragic character, mm-hmm. uh, essentially. So Ben doesn't really want to go back. Ultimately, of course, he heeds the call to duty, uh, and he does. And eventually, the FF are able to break out of Littleville. There's a great scenes of them as these miniature. Beings trying to work their way out, and it's a wonderful scene where Sue comes across Doom in his sanctum, and Doom has his mask off, and he's playing the piano, and Sue's so moved by how beautiful Doom is. Remember, Doom is a lover of the arts, and then she sees Doom's ravaged face, and Doom is – his senses are so acute. Even though she's invisible and small, he senses right away that she's there, and uh, ultimately you know, the FF rally and defeat Doom, and there's a great – again, almost like a Twilight Zone twist where Doom – to escape, gets his mind out of his armored form into the Professor Vaughn, you know, clay being. But the puppet master destroys the ring Doom is wearing so he can transfer minds back and forth. So now Doom is trapped in the little Professor Vaughn body, and puppet master has reprogrammed all the little robots. They're like villagers with the, with the, the pitchforks now mm-hmm. chasing Doom. <laughs> and the story ends with just saying, you know, Doom in his form can run forever, but of course, so can everybody else. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> I that's love where you, that, that ending. That's where we leave Victor Von Doom uh, at the end of uh, the classic issue yes. 236. Proud Doom brought low by the being he thought yes. his lackey, the puppet master. Yes. And yes. as you said, Chris, he is he is a tragic figure. He's yes. a, a sympathetic figure. Yeah. And probably next to Doom himself, he's probably the most complex – well, maybe Galactus too, but the yeah. most complex human foe that yeah. the Fantastic Four face. And I was very happy to see the little guy, Philip Masters, uh, yeah. get the upper hand at the he's end. He's sitting on Doom's throne in the little castle yeah. at the end. Angry mechanical villain. Villagers yeah. taking vengeance on Doom for not because of uh, not for any slight that Doom perpetrated on the puppet master himself, but for spoiling things for his beloved Alicia, stepdaughter yeah. Alicia, yeah. whom he loves more than life itself. Yeah, and as as Mr. Deaver mentioned, and I, and I agree 100 um, percent, Byrne really explores not only in this story but throughout his arc just the ego of Doom. And you know, there's this scene in this story where Sue's just like, "My God, is ego? He can't even acknowledge for one moment that Reed actually got us out of the situation. He refuses to acknowledge the intellectualism of Reed Richards at any time. Only Doom is superior, and Byrne d- does a lot with that." Hey, go ahead. Doom's not left-handed, is he? Is Doom left-handed? Because yeah. he grabs the glass with his left hand. No, well, no, he he does do that. That doesn't, although. He grabs it with his left hand, and then it looks in the no, next never, never picture like he's slamming know. it down with his right. Um, no, I'm asking because uh, opposite on the opposite page from where he slams the glass down, mm-hmm. he's walking down a spiral staircase in his castle, and the spiral staircase is going the other direction that all spiral staircases go in all castles. <laughs> um, and they deem the world traveler, ladies and gentlemen. Well, they very specifically go the other direction because if you're higher up and you're defending and you're fighting with a sword 
and you're fighting down the steps, right, as people are trying to invade up the staircase. If you're standing up top, you have more room to swing your sword, but if you're coming up and you try to swing your sword, you're going to hit the middle support of the spiral staircase, and you can't really attack the person up top who's defending. So they all, because most people are right-handed, they, they spin counterclockwise up, right? So that when you're coming down the steps, you have more room to swing your right hand. And I just noticed that John Byrne drew it so that it was going the other direction. And I thought, is Doom supposed to be left-handed so he can swing his sword? But it's probably just, Byrne just probably didn't know that little tidbit of castle construction, right? Wow. Absolutely <laughs> magnificent. Ladies and gentlemen, that was vintage Brian Deemer right there. <laughs> yeah, that's something Very I never impressive. thought I'd learn tonight. <laughs> God, I'm glad you're with us. Now, now, go ahead. Pass. I was going to ask, and uh, the the back of this issue is this a brand new Lee Kirby story? This is an adaptation by Lee and Kirby of an episode of the Fantastic Four seventies cartoon, yep. which was itself an adaptation <laughs> of Fantastic Four number five. The oh, first appearance, oh, the oh, first oh. appearance of Doctor Doom. But so, but essentially, this is new artwork from Kirby. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Why, why are you saying yes for? Be- again, because it's based on something nope. they did. But, 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 it is. It's, but, it's got Herbie the robot in yeah, it. Well, that's what I mean. He that's... definitely wasn't in Fantastic Four number five. I'm, I'm trying to find what Kirby was doing at this time, and not a whole lot published work. Well, remember, I'm Kirby yeah. in the mid '70s returned to Marvel. Yeah, but this is like 1981. I'm sorry, it was the '80s. So no, he did go to Hollywood to do some animation. He was, work he was doing. He, he did work for Hanna Barbera. Okay. He was doing, okay. doing storyboards. Um, I don't know the circumstances of. of his return for this particular issue. Um, Probably just the anniversary. I, I would assume so. Yeah. But one thing I want to read just to give an example again of, of how Byrne perfectly captures Doom's ego. He says here, Doubtless Richards forced that traitorous puppet master to betray some weakness in your little, little prison. And Sue thinks his ego is incredible. He refuses to give even the smallest credit to Reed's genius. <laughs> Great. Now, 237, I just think, is a fun sort of interlude issue. It just, again, it just shows Burns' imagination. So an alien, uh, this gigantic female alien shows up in Manhattan, and criminals are, are, have sort of co-opted her into their gang. They're just a yep, bunch the, of hobos. Yeah, they're just – you know, they're thieves. And Reed finally figures out she is drunk on the Earth's oxygen-rich atmosphere because her, her, her biological makeup is not accustomed to our atmosphere, and – he finally is able to get her back to her ship where her fellow explorers are, and then they are able to use Reed's you know, universal translator, of course, to communicate. And it's just – again, it's just a fun little twist uh, you know, on, on a, a, you know, a typical alien. Why is this alien here and what are their motives? And you know, Well, she's just drunk. That's why she's basically acting this way essentially. Now, also, not, not only is that great for this issue, but the title page shows Spider-Man and his amazing friends starting. Back in September oh, of right. 81. So that was kind of cool to see one. Because I did watch that from the beginning. Oh, I me can too. remember doing that. And uh, that was just a neat little perspective for me. Well, it's, I'm glad you mentioned that because especially as we go back to books that we, we came out when we were growing up, you know, the, a lot of times you see those little shout outs to things that were so important to us yeah. in terms of cartoons or toys or anything of that nature. And, and there's no ads through – the omnibus, but yeah. yet the title pages, the, the covers are intact. In and, I, and I remember in, like in the late 70s, it often have you know ads for the Hulk, Marvel's mm-hmm. TV sensation you know, yeah. and stuff like that. So those are just fun little uh, uh, windows in, in, into the past there. Um, and and Spider- the, Go ahead, Brian. Uh, I'm sorry. On the fourth page of this issue where the thing walks into the gym, that – gigantic contraption that he's you know going to use to exercise or whatever is an example of the amazing machines that oh, burn yeah. can produce yeah. right and that's very much inspired by kirby uh you know these wondrous devices now issue 38 is, is one moment i'm please? sorry adam please go ahead i just have, what i'm going to say here is going to segue into the next please issue. please um yeah in issue 237 there's a johnny storm subplot here where he uh, uh he goes to visit frankie ray who is of course at the center ah uh, yes thank you for reminding me yes and uh, she is all distraught over something that she's just discovered about herself which she's going to reveal to johnny but before johnny goes in he encounters uh, in the doorway on page 430 of the omnibus uh, you, you have it open to that page right now i see uh juliet d'angelo who is frankie ray's roommate julie angel to her friends an actress, yep. yes. And, and yeah, she's uh, taking acting classes and she's kind of, um, I don't know, she's, she's, she's ebullient and uh, yeah. a little bit of a 
a, a, what's the word I'm looking for? A gadabout, a dabbler, a dilettante. Yes. Um, yeah, she, she's a little on the flighty side. Uh, but uh, she and Johnny eventually do kind of develop something of a romantic dalliance about which Johnny is a lot more serious than she ever is. Absolutely. In fact, Byrne does a lot with that as, as a recurring subplot with Johnny. I'll tell you, Johnny, written throughout this entire book, is a lot more doubting, heartfelt, and sincere than what I ever would have thought him for more recent readings and viewings on multimedia things. That's a good point because you're right. When you think of the stereotype of Johnny Storm, like you think of the way Chris Evans portrayed him yeah. in the movies, for yeah. example. The lighthearted, hearted wise yeah. devil may care adventure. If, if, we, if, you want, if you want a snapshot of Johnny Storm, that's what you think of essentially. Mm-hmm. But you're right. Berman explores the fact that this guy's never had a successful relationship. Like, really, all of his relationships have failed yeah. in terms of women. And even though he's because he's got the reputation as like the hot rod womanizer, but um, here, here, Byrne explores that. You know, and this happens with Frankie Ray too. Yeah. And even when you think about what happens, will happen later with Alicia. That for all his looks and his charm, he really there's a lot going on inside this guy that that's a little bit darker. And, and you know, and, and they explore that, which is which is great storytelling. Now, issue 238, as Adam mentioned, there's something going on. And Frankie was introduced, I think, in the Bronze Age, like yeah, like way back. 164 exactly. in yeah. 1975 was so her she's, first appearance. She's been around a while, yep, really. She's a Roy Thomas creation, not too surprising because she's turning out to be a Golden Age yes. legacy character here. Always hats off to Roy Thomas, one of the great living masters of the medium. Indeed. Um, and we find out that Frankie is the stepdaughter of Phineas Horton, the scientist who created the Golden Age Human Torch. And in a flashback scene, we find that when she was a child or a teenager, um, they went to Horton's old warehouse, his laboratory, and she actually got doused with some chemicals that were involved in the creation of the Golden Age Human Torch, Jim Hammond. And it turns out that she develops flame powers, and Horton wants her to have a normal life, so I guess he kind of hypnotizes her. Man of many talents, that Professor yeah. <laughs> Horton. And uh, – she forgets that she has these powers, and then she has this – why don't you explain this outfit that she's wearing? Um, it's, a, it's kind of a one-piece bathing suit complete with <laughs> uh, gloves and booties, uh, which she apparently has been wearing continuously ever since the incident in her childhood. But she doesn't realize it. Yeah, and neither anybody else. Yeah, it becomes yeah. somehow invisible whenever yeah. she's covered mostly by clothing. But whenever she's mostly naked, yeah. it suddenly becomes visible uh, to everyone else and also to herself. Yeah. Yeah. And at the same time as uh, d- d- her, her stepfather also programmed her with pyrophobia. So that, right. that was kind of a major – But subconsciously she's drawn to Johnny without real- – even though she's, she's uncomfortable around his flaming powers because of really what happened Yeah, to her, that was kind of a stumbling block in their relationship yeah. at this point. But now we realize that she's really been drawn to his yes. flame. And well done, Murd. And actually another important point in issue 230, a lot happens to this issue. Reed says, all right, old friend. Ben, I really know for sure I can finally cure you. <laughs> now, this has been an ongoing plot line throughout the entire of the Fantastic Four. The guilt Reed feels about the space flight and the cosmic rays that transform Ben into the thing. And it's really more specific to Ben than anybody else. Yes. I mean, he's guilty about everybody, but Ben more well, so. Well, because the other, the other members of the team can Function. appear, quote, normal, yeah. right? Um, so he says, I, I figured it out, and... He tries to cure Ben, but what happens is Ben, quote, devolves, and it's the dramatic final splash page of the issue, into how he appeared in the first issues of Fantastic Four, almost like this kind of this lump. Yeah. Not really rocky as in the famous visage of the thing, more of like a – almost like a mud creature. I, I mean he's just more amorphous in, in – in not amorphous, but he, like he's not as distinct in his features, shall we say. Um but Ben kind of just, you know, he's Ben Grimm. He's one of the. He's really one of the strongest, not just his, in terms of strength, but in terms of his character and his stick to and his fortitude. He's, he's all right. He kind of accepts it and, and moves on. And issue two thirty nine. All I had to write for this was Aunt Petunia revealed. And I remember Jamie in one of our discussions on the air actually talked about this wonderful moment in the FF's history because. Thing the thing we always talk about my aunt Petunia right and um, aunt Petunia's favorite nephew yeah. Murd outstanding I, you do do the Ben Ben's voice justice thanks kid <laughs> <laughs> start talking about gold bricking in a second or something like that and we go to this is it Arizona they're in this little town I was gonna say New Mexico or New Mexico okay uh, no it is Arizona, Arizona you're right okay Benson Arizona just and now. this is this is we get a little bit into the to Ben's family history where 
His parents died when he was young, and his his uh his uncle, what was his name? I'm sorry, Jacob. Jacob. Okay, Which is kind of a Kirby tribute since that's right. His real name was Jacob. That's right, Jacob and Kurtzberg. Actually, Benjamin J. Grimm. The J is for Jacob. Well, many many fans and comic historians feel that the thing is really modeled after Kirby in terms of the way he spoke, the cigar. Yeah. That's what a lot of people think, anyway. Um, I can certainly see that. Mm-hmm. So. Something's Aunt Petunia is is actually this much younger woman. She's beautiful, who married an, an older uh, Jacob Grimm. Jacob Grimm's I think his wife was killed in a car accident, she, and Aunt Petunia was a nurse, and she kind of helped him, in that, and they developed a relationship. And people in their small town are basically dying of fright or experiencing intense fear. And she goes to the Baxter Building, and it's, it's just a great joke where. Ben's like, oh, my aunt. Murdy, you should do the voice because I can't do the thing well. All right. Well, let me find the page. Yeah, first please of all. do. Uh, where, okay, where is it? Which page? Okay. Yeah, okay, he just says, Aunt Petunia. <laughs> and Johnny, <laughs> said, Johnny thinks in his word bubble, Aunt Petunia? And then the joke is you have Johnny thinking this multiple times now throughout these scenes. He just can't, he's a gog. He can't believe that this gorgeous young woman with this lithe figure is Aunt Petunia. And uh, Burgess has a lot of fun with that. And you know, the FF have to go to it's, – it's, it's a fun sort of one-and-done adventure where they go to this town to try to figure out what's happening. And we realize that this young girl is being abused by her, her terrible father uh, has sought solace in these – I guess these ancient beings who are – Little yeah, – like gremlins or yeah. poltergeists yes. to coin a phrase. Who are, who are manifestations of, of, of just pure elemental raw fear. And they're actually the, – the, the little girl's relationship with these – not the little girl means for this to happen, but you know what she's experiencing has brought these beings to, to the, the forefront, and people in the town are actually dying or just being consumed by uh, their fear. And, and the FF are able to not really – they don't really save the town. They kind of just – they kind of break the spell essentially. Yeah, they, uh, they help facilitate. Yeah. Uh, a reconciliation between uh, – And well, the father kind of sees the error of his ways. Yeah, after yeah. being threatened with immolation by uh, Frankie yeah. Ray. Yes. Yeah. And I want to point out here, I start – I mean as a reader myself, I start to find Frankie Ray's character troubling in these stories. And you start to get the sense that there, there's, there's an edge to this woman and because she, her, her life was not normal by any stretch. I mean she was self – she was hypnotized by her stepfather – she just realized she has these powers, which you know she's obviously reveling the ability because she, she has flame powers like Johnny. So not as powerful as him, but she can fly and you know, all that kind of stuff. And as we approach, you know, a, a key turning point in her character's development that I, I personally found very troubling, which, which we're going to get into. Um, issue two forty, you can't have a great FF arc without the Inhumans. So Byrne is going to explore, and it just the artwork is breathtaking. Uh, the Inhumans – and they've, they've mentioned this before. The Inhumans are suffering because of the pollution of Earth's atmosphere, and they realize they have to move Adelan from the Himalayas, the, the great refuge, off the Earth to, to, to restore the health of the Inhuman uh, race. And Reed, of course, using his, uh, you know, his incom- incomparable scientific uh, know-how, helps the Inhumans move their city to the blue area of the moon. Now, Murder Crippen, everyone, the blue area of the moon was set up as a – a, a test site for between the Kotati and the Cree by the scrolls. So they could, where it wasn't a contest to see which one gets scroll technology, basically. Um, I think it was. Well, it was a contest and it involved Cree's scrolls and Kotati. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Just, uh, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, yeah, I guess yeah, it was the scrolls. Um, and uh, the Cree used. They were primitive at that. And time. the Cree, no, the Cree used violence in their contest, and that sort of started the the the, the fight between the scrolls. Mm. Uh, in the Cree. Mm-hmm. But these ruins have been there for you know millennia or however long it is. And the FF are able to get Adelan to the blue air of the moon and, and Crystal's pregnant with Quicksilver's child. Uh, quick Crystal, bad choice there for a marriage partner. And um, <laughs> and Luna is born. Of course, Luna becomes you know a, a, a character in her own right essentially. And she's – and they've, they reveal in the story that because of Quicksilver's mutant biology and Crystal's in human biology that Luna is born a normal human essentially. I also wanted to point out here, I think Byrne mentioned that Lockjaw, he used the term as a cousin of the Inhumans. So you start to think that maybe Lockjaw is not a pet, that 
the lock jaws in you and who went through the Terrigen ritual and, and came out this massive teleporting dog, essentially. Yeah. Hmm. Which I because people have interpreted what lockjaw is in different ways. Yeah, and they've been contradicting yeah. each other for years. Yeah, but Burn, Some people I know like Burn, the idea of lockjaw as a very mutated inhuman. Others yeah. think he's just a, a canine with inhuman powers. Yeah, but Burn, I'm mean, I use the term cousin here, so I just thought that was interesting. Also, a little note is I see on the cover that Terry Austin inked the cover, but not the interiors. So ah, thank you, Burn, sir. getting some help on the cover. Well, I was reading an interview with Burn, and, and he was saying how because he was being asked about. Terry Austin's work is, you know, he said, I, I never, I'm paraphrasing here, but he didn't necessarily think that Austin would work well with him, but he was just, he's like, wow, it worked. It just, you know, the results of, of their, of their, and, and that's one of the legendary penciler inker team up, certainly in American comics, is yeah, John absolutely. Byrne and Terry Austin. And speaking of the uh, Byrne Austin partnership, uh, the uh, narrative captions inside the story make note of the fact that uh, Adelan is set down smack dab on top of the spot on the blue area of the moon well done. That's where right. Jean Grey died. That's right. In X Men 137. Good callback, Mert. Issue 241, you got to have Wakanda at some point appear in, in, in the FF. Um, and uh, the FF traveled to Wakanda, and they are exploring the fact that there is this – it's almost like uh, – oh, Mr. Deemer, what's that? Uh, in Wyoming, what's the – that magnificent mountain that was a close encounter of the third kind? Devil oh, Devil's, Devil's Tower. Devil's Tower, yes. Thank you. It's almost like that, but it's this black, almost marble-like structure in the jungle, and a Soviet exploration party went there, and they, 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 they're they all reduced to skeletons. So the FF – remember, the FF, we have to always remember, are explorers first and foremost. They're not really crime fighters. You know, Mark Wade you know, used the term imaginauts, which I always love for the <laughs> FF, and you know, a lot of the stories really remind us that – Yes, they'll 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 do things to protect humanity from all kinds of different th threats, cosmic or or you know, you know more on on the Earth itself. But first and foremost, they're explorers and adventurers. You know, again, going back to that challenge of the unknown uh, tradition, which probably was an inspiration in some ways for the FF. And they go with the Black Panther, and they find out that there is a time lost Roman civilization in the in, like, along the lines of the Roman Empire in this structure. And it turns out that the Emperor, so to speak, he's named himself after I think Tiberius Augustus and I think Claudius, if I remember correctly. Um, he is actually a time lost Roman legionnaire who came across this alien technology, which has allowed him to live for centuries past you know his normal lifespan, and he used this power to create this and in kind of enslaving the the Africans who were living there into this Roman civilization, and uh, you know he makes. Ben and Johnny fight as gladiators, and you know, he takes Sun Tzu as his empress, or he's trying to. And ultimately, the, the FF and the Black Panther uh, defeat him, and, and he they remove his helmet, and then that's all that's keeping him corporeal, and he just he, he vanishes. It's just a, another fun sort of Twilight Zone feel. Uh, and again, the the artwork in this when he shows like the Roman temples, oh, yeah. and it's it's so gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, I mean, think back to Burns' work in the X Men, like when they go to the Savage Land, and you know. The, the, the petrified man's you know stronghold and just all these magnificent uh, structures he creates. Now, 242 is where we really start – I think where Byrne really starts to, to kind of world build in terms of his take on the Fantastic Four. Terax returns. All right, Terax the tamer, and he's out for blood. And basically he wants the FF to destroy Galactus for him. And this brings us into, I think, which one of the classic issues of the Burn Run, which I mentioned before when I was waxing rhapsodic about my childhood, which is issue 243, classic Lee Kirby hyperbole in the, in the title, Shall Earth Endure? And then on the cover, Everyone versus Galactus. I'm sure many listeners aren't familiar with this cover. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a pose you're used to seeing Galactus in where he's actually fighting many heroes in the Marvel Universe who are kind of swarming around him like ants, all right, trying to bring him down. And Terax has used his axe to carve Manhattan out of the bedrock because he has the power cosmic. And he, he levitates Manhattan into the atmosphere, into space with a dome around. And then you have the – it's, it's very uh, poignant now when, when, when you think about modern history. You have the Twin Towers projecting out of the dome, and, and uh, Sue is, is using her powers to try to – what is she trying to do now? Try to keep Manhattan intact? Yeah, I think maybe the dome was uh, her creation, actually. Okay, thank you, because she's struggling to do that. 
Um, and Terex has carved off the top few floors of the Baxter building, which is a very dramatic image with his axe. And Sue's there trying to keep everything together, and Frankie's there with her. And Ben, Johnny, and Reed wearing uh, space suits and, and uh, oxygen helmets are on the top of the Twin Towers facing Terex. And Galactus says, all right, I've had enough of this, and he, and he deprives Terex of his powers. When you think about it, these heralds are kind of dumb. You really think you can take on Galactus when he created you, basically? <laughs> yeah. And uh, he, he sends Terex plummeting back to Earth. He's just, he's just Tyros again. You assume mm-hmm. he's been killed. Um, he isn't, of course. And then Galactus is weakened, and he has to say, I have to devour the Earth. And the FF and the Avengers uh, fight together. The artwork here is breathtaking. And you have a dramatic page, f- a full splash page where you see Galactus in pants. I can only imagine how much this page goes for. Uh, toppling to the Earth as the thing just is projected and smashes right into Galactus' Galactus's helmet. And topples him, and you see Galactus collapse into a building. It's a very dramatic image. It's something you never thought you'd see before. And Galactus is just prone, defeated. And he's so weak, his body is actually shrinking before the eyes of the FF, Doctor Strange, and the Avengers. And in issue 244, it reads like, look, we have to save him as a sentient being. Cap agrees. And again, uh, Mr. Deem referring to the wonderful technological devices Byrne imagines here. And Reed creates sort of this massive, like, harness that they place Galactus in, and uh, his life is saved. But Galactus is still hungry. And then Frankie comes along and says, you know what? I've been reading about your history with Galactus and the Heralds. And she says, I want to become your Herald if, if you – and I'll find you new planets if you, you know, leave the Earth. And, Re- and Reed's saying, you know what? Frankie, I forbid it. You don't know what you're saying. You don't know what you're getting into. And Johnny's, you know, like, you know, babe, you know, he's what are you distraught. doing? He's He's like, you can't believe and, – and this is where I find Frankie's character actually revolting. Because she's so consumed with what she wants to do, and Reed says, "Look, Frankie, you know, eventually you're gonna have to take him to planets that are gonna be inhabited." She says, "She says, ah, what's what's you know, a few more bug-eyed monsters." And I'm like, "Really? Yeah. Really? Okay, so you're gonna accept being a genocidal mass murderer? So you can have basically have a, a fun fling in space, hmm. uh, Johnny? You're better off here." Yeah, uh, I'm wondering actually between this issue and the issue before it, um, where where Frankie sort of gets the idea to go to Galactus, she, she's yeah. acting like she's almost halfway in a trance. Yeah, it's it's like, a good point, Murd. It's that's maybe a, Galactus I mean, is influencing it's her. Possible, from a distance. because when we think about what, later on, she becomes Nova. They call her Nova, mm. and she becomes a companion of the Silver Surfer. This is in the eighties, yeah, and the, or the even the, maybe in the nineties. Well, yeah, exactly. into the early nineties. Yeah. yeah, and I the Silver Surfer makes her aware of what she's actually doing for Galactus. And she actually then turns on Galactus and, and it becomes like a companion of the surface. So her character goes through an arc. I don't, I don't mean to dismiss her completely. Yeah. But in this case, and that's a good point where maybe that may be, may be because I'll, I'll read from page 593 in the omnibus. Reed says, there would inevitably come a time when you would have to lead him to an inhabited world. She goes, so? A few less bug-eyed monsters? What's that compared to my being able to go out there? So she's transformed in the time on tradition of becoming a herald of Galactus. Um, and she goes off, and Johnny is completely devastated. He ends up, and actually, the story begins with, with where Byrne does a, a kind of flash forward t- framing device where the story begins with Johnny completely distraught going to, Ju- is it Julia the name of her roommate? Yeah, Julie, yeah, yeah. To Ju- her de- apartment. Julie Angel. Um, so. Yeah, Johnny actually tries to fly after her. Yes. Uh, after, after she's been made she Nova. Just, she callously ignores him. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's yeah. kind of like in. Well, when, when she first gets her flame powers, it's like she's at a high basically. Earlier, yeah. Yeah. She soars up, and uh, Johnny has to go after her to yeah. catch her when she falls, when she runs out of oxygen and burns out. Yeah. But here, he's the, the roles are reversed. She yeah. now has the ability to go beyond the atmosphere without. Uh, you know, her flame is cosmic now, so she doesn't need oxygen. And Johnny is the one whose right. flame gutters out and he falls, but there's no one there to catch him. And on page 599, a little bit of Garfield hanging out in the apartment. <laughs> it is the early 80s, isn't it? It sure is. Oh, God, I totally missed that. Well done. Wow. <laughs> you saw the, the Muppet poster, of course. You saw oh, that. yes, yes. Oh, yeah. On page 603. Yep. I guess there weren't copyright concerns at that time. Well, Fabulous. Well, especially with the Muppets, um, Marvel did star comics, so that's true. They might have been doing them at that time. I can't quite that's a good remember point. the years. Well, they of that did stuff. Heathcliff. I don't think did they do star. They did a Muppet yeah, Baby. Star Comics babies. was in the eighties. Yeah. No, but did they do Garfield? Is what I'm. No, no, no. That's just a little wink and a nod, I guess. Yeah. And they did do a movie adaptation of the Muppets Take Manhattan. Sure. Yeah, they sure. That's did. That's right. Now another another again, Byrne also revisits 
what's going on with Franklin? And there's a fun scene where the Yancey Street gang has delivered to Ben a Rubik's Cube again. It's the 80s, mm-hmm. and Ben is – he's so frustrated he can't solve the cube, and he kind of tosses it off to Franklin. So he says, you know, I'm going to go out and get us some food or something, and Franklin becomes so frustrated with the cube he uses his power, which was supposedly wasn't active, and he destroys the Rubik's Cube, and you go, uh-oh. Franklin's powers are no, no longer latent here. As well as, doesn't he also blow up the robot? Uh, he yes. Solves yes. The Rubik, he solves the Rubik's Cube. He blows up the robot. Yeah, because the robot is designed to uh, monitor his powers. His powers yeah. return, yeah. But uh, his powers have now spiked so high that the robot can't process all that uh, psionic energy, and it blows. And at the same time, here's some foreshadowing. Uh, a rerun of Leave it to Beaver is on in the background. Yeah. <laughs> and Franklin hears Wally say, Ah, Beaver, when are you going to grow up? Uh, that's right. And that coincides with the power surge, and that leads to the next issue. Oh. Well done, Adam. Oh, one more important thing about uh, this issue, number 244, though. In one of the other epilogues, or prologues, as it's called, uh, uh, Reed Richards finally buys the Baxter That's building. right, from Collins, the c- cantankerous and miserly uh, landlord. <laughs> I like I like when he's walking past and Sue says hi to him. He's got little money things going around <laughs> his head, crawling around Reed his head. Reed writes him a check. Yeah. He's off to build his money bin. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so... The next issue is very important in the in Sue's character trajectory. Um, it really focuses on her, and she she's having an interview with Barbara. Uh, is it Walker? Yep. Yeah. Who's always supposed to be Barbara Walters, and uh, Walker's actually taking her to task. Like Walker's coming on as a very strong feminist and saying, you know, why are you call the invisible girl? Like, why did you take your husband's last name? name? You know, you're like, you're like, you're like, a, you're like a third wheel to your husband. And Byrne does a wonderful – this is really great writing in Sue – and Sue is very calm, very poised, very professional, but not backing down and defending her choices as a, as a modern woman and why she's doing what she's doing as, as a superhero, as a mother, as a husband. It's really the, – the writing is really well done uh, in these scenes. And while this is happening, as Murd mentioned, the foreshadowing, Franklin has transformed into his adult self, complete with long hair and beard. And he changes Ben back to his familiar rocky exterior that we all, we all know and love. With just a touch. Yeah. Yeah. We, again, we can't – Franklin – now, Adam, does Franklin have reality warping powers essentially? Um, his, his psionic abilities yeah. have uh, really never been they're almost, li- they're almost limitless essentially yeah, yeah yeah so he can well he created the whole pocket universe yeah. for the heroes the reborn thing yeah, yeah. so if he can do that, that 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 counts as reality warping i think yeah so his he, he kind of burns out his uh, adult self and yeah. uh, you know uses uses up all his uh, ex, excess psionic energy yeah. and reverts himself to a child in this uh, act of you know, putting ben's rocky skin back on him and Eventually, the, 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 the FF don't realize who he is at first. They think he's just some cosmic being run amok. Yeah. And then, of course, a mother always knows who he goes, my mm-hmm. God, it's Franklin. And you know, it, it's, it's, it's actually pointed because he's like a little kid talking in this adult mommy in this adult body. And uh, ultimately, they're able to restore him. And then Reed realizes that – Well, ben, they don't restore him. He does it well, after he touches the thing. I, right. I think all that power yeah, goes he just, into – He spontaneously thing. reverts. Oh, yes. Thank you, sir. Thank to you. his proper age. And – Reed then realizes, my God, Ben has a mental block. He does. He, I, he pro- I probably could cure him, yeah. but he's afraid if, 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 he, if he becomes fleshy, Alicia won't love him. And they even play with the, the notion that maybe Alicia does the feel that way. You're not really sure by the way she responds. And we have to, we have to remember what pathos there is around Ben Grimm. He's one of the most tragic characters in the Marvel Universe, but also one of the most noble and the most loyal, essentially. Great issue. Now, Doom. Yeah. And this is important because this is one of Jamie's favorite arcs, I think, and he always talked about this in the run of the Fantastic Four. Now, in 246, when we left, Doom is trapped in the Professor Vaughn body, running around Littleville being chased by the mob. And one of Doom, one of the Doom bots, because remember, Doom has a contingency for every – anything that happened, he has a contingency planned. So one of the Doom bots appears over Littleville. And apparently slays the puppet master. Now the puppet master does come back, though, doesn't he? He does. Yeah, I think he's next seen in the Thing solo series, or possibly Marvel Two and One. I've got, I've got. Yeah, it's in the Thing. I have a note here about it. So we have to assume that on. somehow he got his mind back into his re- regular body. Yeah, yeah, by a couple of uh, external, uh, well, advantageous circumstances, he manages to. Yeah. Well, I'll, 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 I'll say more sure. about that later. So the Doombot. Uh, Grabs the uh, 
Professor Vaughn miniature because that has Doom's mind in it. And he returns to a, a, a craft where they have um, – they've, re- they've regained Doom's actual body. Now, the FF had Doom's body in stasis because his mind was empty, and they returned to the Latvian embassy. And it's, it's, it just reminds you of the cruelty of Doom. The ambassador there dares just – he doesn't even think. He just questions Doom just in an innocuous way, and the Doom bot just breaks his neck. I mean, you have to realize you know, the Doom bots think they're Doom. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the, the brutality of Doom. And um, the FF get trapped in the Latvian embassy in New York City. They, they face different Doom bots and different traps. And eventually they're, they're ferried off by the ship, and, and the real Doom is restored. His mind is restored to his body. And this leads us to, I think, one of the all time great Fantastic Four issues. I and mean, this is one of Jamie's favorites. Oh, it sure was. Issue 247 This land is mine! And of course, the cover has Doom, you know, towering over uh, Latveria, after Doomstadt, the capital of Latveria. And we, and the FF, to their horror, realized that Zorba is no longer a benevolent monarch; he's become a, des- a despot, and he's reprogrammed Doom's murderous uh, robotic secret police to terrorize the people of Latveria. That that next page, six fifty four and fifty five in the omnibus, oh, it's gorgeous. Is the the second and third page of the issue, and that's that's my next. And and each each time I gasp, it gets better and grander. So, so fantastic in, in an almost traditional Doom pose, like I think, and and I think of it from the Spider Man and His Amazing Friends opening theme cartoon, huh. where yeah. you see Doom in that pose, and I'm, I'm yeah. doing the pose that nobody can see <laughs> with all the FF around him yeah. uh, on the splash. These two pages, and you also have beautiful one, one of the classic uh, again the the Kirby influence Reed restraining the thing. That you we often see those covers where like Reed is stretching his elastic powers to prevent the thing from going off half cocked. It's a classic image which Byrne pays tribute to there. Now we've talked about this issue at length in our Doctor Doom spotlight, uh, but just to quickly because uh, it's it's a great issue. It's just yeah. it really the, the FF are forced to unite with Doom because they realize Zorba has become this tyrant, and there's an, the, and Kristoff is introduced here who will become Doom's ward. This this child. His mother is slain by one of the robotic enforcers that Zorba's yeah. reprogrammed. Literally seconds after Doom promises that she is under his protection. Yes, and Doom is yeah. – and remember, Doom in his own warped way loves his people as long as they're obedient. Mm-hmm. As long as they appreciate the fact that they have prosperity. There's security. no freedom, but they have security and prosperity, and all that he demands in return is absolute unflinching obedience at all times. Yeah. So – Kristoff becomes a very important character over the years in the FF universe as well, right up th- right through the present day, actually. And he's older now, of course. But so the FF helped Doom restore him, restore the throne, restore himself to the throne. And there's a great scene where a, a power mad Zorba is, is and it's actually petty and pathetic, is trying to use his little eye beam to fight Doom, which Doom himself created, and he, of course he has a, a contingency to, to block it. And you don't see Doom kill Zorba, but you assume he does because um, he wants to wipe out that bloodline. That, remember, that bloodline murdered Doom's family, mm-hmm. right? Because the, 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 monarch, the monarchy of Latveria is what uh, killed his mother and also lit, drove his father to, to death through exposure in, in the winter. So there's, there's a lot of bad blood there, to say the least. But again, I, I refer to this, if you haven't listened to our Dr. Doom spotlight, uh, we, we go hot and heavy into Dr. Doom and uh, in that spotlight, his whole and, history. And now having read this, I'll have to go back and listen to that again. I mean, I know I was here for that, but <laughs> I'd be interested to listen to that again now having read that story. Yeah. Episode 1505, back in September of 2014. Pansy, knew we could count on you. Issue 248 is a, another kind of fun one-and-done story. Um, it turns out that, well, seemingly, the moon has been captured and abducted by this these giant beings who are you know bigger than the moon and the ff end up in there like they're you know however big their ship is and you know the inhumans everybody starts to be killed or or, or dying off of trying to stop this because you know this this being has abducted the moon now you can imagine what that did to the earth by the way if the moon suddenly vanished yeah, think yeah. space 1999 for yeah. example which i think the ben grimm makes a joke about that in the story he does um it turns out that 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 triton is it Triton or Triton? Triton, right? I'd say Triton. Triton yeah, just English was exploring the subterranean, I guess, water world in the moon, and he comes upon these crystals that sort of 
uh, I guess they they kind of tap into people's greatest fears and and and, and traumas. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Like Reed sees Sue dying, like disintegrating in his hands, and that kind of snaps Reed out of it, and he realizes that oh, none of this is actually really happening. Yeah. All the time he's remarking yeah. to himself, "This is impossible. These yeah. the beings that large they can't exist. They, they couldn't even stand up if they were that yeah, big. If, if this yeah. ship were really this large, we were really this many hundreds of miles apart. We couldn't hear each other, but we yeah. can. So yeah. it's just like a, a little bit of a, a tweak to the the, the, the the golly gee wow. It's another uh, fun kind of Twilight Zone type type, uh, type episode, basically. It's, 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 it's a fun it's a fun one shot. The next two issues are very important. Issues two forty nine to two fifty. John Byrne draws the X Men again. Well, it's not really the X-Men scrolls, but it must have been a thrill for readers at the time to see Byrne rendering you know, Storm Colossus, Nightcrawler, and Cyclops. And this story, Gladiator, who of course comes out of the classic uh, Shi'ar stories from the, the really, you know, s- space operatic a- aspects of the X-Men in the Claremont, Cochran, Byrne era. I think Cochran, desi- Cochran designed the Gladiator. He designed all the Imperial Guard. They're, they're yeah, very much his style. Sort of based on the Legion yeah. of, of whom Cochran was a, a fan. Well, Nightcrawler originally I think was supposed to be a member exactly. of the Legion. Yeah. yeah. So it, Gladiator comes to Earth trying to warn the FF that the scrolls are up to no good. I mean, the scrolls throughout the Marvel Universe, its history, are one of the most warlike of all the races that you know, the, the, the Earth, Earth has experienced or, or come in contact with. But he's duped into thinking the FF are scrolls. So you get this great two-issue Donnybrook between the Gladiator, who's incredibly powerful. He's supposed to be Superman, after Yes, all. essentially, or yes. Or Superboy, if yeah. you will. Fighting uh, the FF and – Scrolls show up impersonating the X Men, so you have this this sort of three way battle going on. Then Captain America and Spider Man show up, the real Cap and Spidey, who are confused as to what's actually going on, who they're fighting, and it's it's, it's a it's, it's a great action. It's a great action story, mm. and uh, you know eventually everybody realizes who's who here, who's a scroll and who isn't. And Reed also determines the full nature of Gladiator's powers. That is, it's not just his strength. That I think he has. Does he have? Does Gladiator have psionic powers? Essentially, yeah, yeah, yeah. Reed figures out that his powers—well, uh, they're they're partly physical, but uh, more importantly, psionic. So by disrupting his, well, playing with his mind, he's able yeah. to, well, kind of snap something in his brain a bit and turn him off temporarily, right. long enough for him to come to his senses. And it's fun to see Cap and Spidey try to figure out who's a scroll and who isn't. Um, at one point, one of the scrolls turns from Nightcrawler to Angel. It, it, it's, it's a great action issue. Yeah. And uh, all the characters other than the FF, uh, whenever the uh, X-Men speak, they yeah. remark, well, what language is he That's speaking? That's right, because they're speaking the scroll They don't language. have universal translators right. like the FF do. Hmm. Well put, Mert. Oh, yeah. And uh, I'm yeah. showing Shane here this uh, great you – know, talking about what a great uh, fight oh, yeah, story awesome. this is. Yeah. Page 709, 709 here. In, omnibus, yeah. Yeah, where uh, Gladiator punches the thing and it takes two uh, parallel diagonal panels to show how many cars the thing smashes yeah. through before he finally comes to a stop. Which is eight, by the way. Clever page design there by Byrne. Yeah. Well, again, you know, one of the reasons I was so excited to do this is just John Byrne is one of the great – for me, one of the great living masters in comics. Well, and that's something where, while, while I've heard and, and appreciate and understand, and I've seen some things, but having gone through this really gives me a new appreciation for it, something that I did not know or see this much of before. Shane, that does my heart good to hear. It really does. Yeah. Now, we've, we, uh, Mr. Deemer referenced this before, and I think I, I agree. I think it's one of the high, high watermarks of Burns' run, the Negative Zone saga. Issues 251 to 256 – where the FF, again, not seeking trouble, they're just going to explore the negative zone. Murray, could you just explain for the listeners just how the negative zone differs from the positive matter universe that the FF live in? Well, it's a, a parallel universe, yeah. uh, which happens to be com- contained exclusively antimatter. So th- th- there need to be special precautions taken whenever traveling from one to the other because if you, you don't – You can be destroyed, right? Yeah, yeah. There needs to be a molecule-by-molecule molecule substitution of matter for <laughs> antimatter analogs. You need to convert your entire body into antimatter before you can go to the negative zone or you'll create a cataclysmic explosion that will destroy pretty much the entire universe, whichever universe you're going to as soon as you go Because they can't coexist in the right. same matter spot. Matter and antimatter right? yeah. cancel – explosively cancel each other right. out. And we have to think back to the classic F- FF51, this man, this monster. Where you know we talked about how it's one of the greatest stories in the history of the Fantastic Four, where this this petty scientist is jealous of Reed Richards, impersonates the thing, and Reed and, and they end up in the negative zone, and, the, and Reed and, and he, this imposter are going to actually hit that barrier and be destroyed, and the imposter realizes the nobility of Reed, and he actually 
kind of takes on Ben's nobility and, and throws Reed back into the positive man universe and allows himself to die, essentially. It's one of the great Lee Kirby stories of all time. Um, now, 252, Shane mentioned this, is the famous cinematic issue. It's also one of the two issues that month which had the Lakeside Tattoos advertisement on it. <laughs> That and Spider-Man 238, which is the first appearance of the Hobgoblin. True, true. And I should just to reassure back issue collectors, the value of the book does not – it doesn't change whether or not you have, still have the tattoo in the comic. Um, but this issue is so gorgeous because you got to read it. you got to flip the book because Byrne drew every page like you're looking at a movie screen. Lenticular? Is that correct? Mm. No, just sideways. <laughs> Landscape. Brian, what, and, uh, what, uh, being the art fan you are, what do you think of this issue? Well, I mean, it's beautiful, right? It's cool. <laughs> I, I like the, I, you know, every once in a while you got to mix it up a little bit, right? If every comic is always the same, sort of like, uh, you know, Dave Sim did some interesting things in some issues of Cerebus where uh, as the panels go, it, it makes a circle, so you have to keep turning the book a little bit as you read each panel you know you gotta you gotta get creative with it and uh so i think it's cool that's a great point it's nice sometimes when it, when an artist makes you work a little bit when you when you're reading so there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever yeah there's even you know some pages in here where he has arrows that show you how to read the yep. panels because it's a little different than what you're used to or whatever and i think that's cool now, this story, uh, while the FF are exploring, unbeknownst to them, Annihilus has uh, crossed dimensions into the Baxter building. And this is actually frightening because we often forget Annihilus is one of the most terrifying villains probably in the Marvel Universe. I mean – Living death that walks. Yeah, yeah, he's a living death that walks, and he's, he's a cold-blooded killer of the First Order. I mean, when we get to the 2000s, we'll talk about what happens between him and Johnny Storm uh, in recent history. And interestingly enough, Annihilus removes his helmet. That's not his face. And they, they, At times it has been, but uh, see, he's, has it? Okay, he's gotten so old and withered. He, he's, yeah. he, he mentions in the story that he's crafted this helmet because okay. it resembles what his face oh, used I, to okay, look Oh, okay, I missed like. that. Well done, Adam. Well done. Because remember, Nihilus, if I think back to your explanation when we talked about him in the Silver Age, he was like a microorganism on a, a, a space arc yeah, that was exploring. A little carnivorous insect, basically. Yeah. And, and he evolved. Uh, yeah, after the space arc carrying him yeah. crashed onto this uh, planet in the negative. And he got the cosmic right. control rod and became like this intelligent – uh, malevolent insectoid right, being, uh, conqueror basically. and despoiler of yeah. worlds. Yeah, and apparently Annihilus is dying. Yeah, because he's been deprived of the cosmic control rod, yes. his principal weapon, uh, which was also the source of his vitality. Yes, apparently. and he feels that if he's going to die, everybody has to die with him. So he's going to create this. He's going to use like this null field that you talked about to merge both dimensions and just kill everybody. Essentially, he's trying to use the Baxter Building as like the epicenter of this. So the FF go through. I mean, this this is. Art-wise, I think it's one of the high points of Burns' run. They go to all these fantastic uh, worlds in the negative zone. They, they meet different alien races. Mm -hmm. uh, yep, I was thinking to myself as I read this, uh, we know Byrne is a Star Trek fan. so this Absolutely. Is kind of like good point. His way of doing a Star Trek comic with yeah. the FF as the characters. And, and I, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's clearly the case here. And I mean Byrne has done a lot of great Star Trek. I have a, there's a wonderful um, – IDW omnibus. I don't know if you have it, Shane, where they've collected all of Burns' uh, IDW Star Trek stories. Hmm. It's great. I'll have to look at that. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it in next time I okay. see it and lend it to you. It's, they're excellent. So, yeah, Burns' love of Star Trek is well known. Um, but interestingly enough, I found this ver this fascinating. He directly takes on the fact that Reed and, 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 and Brian mentioned this in his introduction are a married couple. And They've made it clear that they need some alone time to have sex, and they really don't hide it at all. I mean the, the, the thing makes a joke about it essentially, and uh, it, it's, I, it's, it's very well done, and they conceive while they're uh, traveling in the negative zone. There will be ramifications from that later on. Now ultimately, uh, they're able to get back. And there's a time with Avengers 234, so the Avengers have to come in because Annihilus is – this null field is created. It's impenetrable. Thor's hammer like penetrates, but then it just drops. And Thor has to run away because he's going to transform back to Don Blake within sixty seconds. The She Hulk can barely, you know, prevent it from from expanding outward. Mm -hmm. But uh, because of her gamma radiation, she's able to make a little more of a dent in a than slight than dent. A lot yeah. of the others. And we have to remember, She Hulk was an Avenger at this point. And the the Avengers working on on their universe, their dimension. The FF working from their side, ultimately able to cancel out the threat of Annihilus. Annihilus is 
sent back in the negative zone where apparently he's killed. He isn't, but it looks that way. But tragically, a nihilist brutalized and injured Alicia, who was there babysitting Franklin. So Ben is very upset because Alicia has been – I mean Annihilus, it looks like he basically beat her essentially. Um, so he's, he's distraught about that. And because the FF moved from the negative universe to the positive one, their costumes change. And we should mention that Byrne had, had already brought back the black bands around the collar and the waist of the classic blue FF costumes. He already made that change going back to their early Silver Age appearances. And now he, as Adam mentioned, he goes into the now the black and white. It's not really blue. It's more of a blue, black, and white costume, essentially. And, and, that's, well, and the blue, I think, are the highlights. I mean, yeah, it is yeah. black. And that's that's their costume for quite some time. Um, in fact, I want to say when they did the when, – when, when that horrible uh, FF movie with, that never was released that's on video. <laughs> yes, I've seen it. Yeah. I think they're wearing those costumes. Hmm. I think. I think you're right, yeah. actually. So hmm. they were around for a while. I've seen a couple of stills from that. I've, I've, I'm kind of grateful that I haven't seen. <laughs> Would you recommend it, Shane? I think it's worth a watch. Oh, you got, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, at least once. It's, it's hilarious. Absolutely. Now, issue 257, we return to Galactus, and it starts with, with Galactus saying, I'm dying. And he's, he's kind of collapsed in his, his chair in his massive world ship, and he, he needs to feed. And Frankie takes him to the Scroll Throne world, and they basically wipe out the bulk of the Scroll race. Essentially, mm. it's a very dramatic and powerful series of images. You, you, I mean, because the Scrolls have been around since the early eight days of the FF, mm-hmm. and in, in in one shot, I mean, and Byrne takes you. It's fast. It's beautiful artwork. He takes you through and terrifying the entire process of how Galactus feeds, essentially, and he. Exterminates almost the entire scroll race, basically. Well, I should point out here that uh, it, it was the scroll throne world as opposed yeah. to the home world that he destroyed. Yeah, oh, the, that's true, Murray. Yeah, because the, the, yeah, the scrolls are still around, but yeah, he, he yeah, wiped out a large They're portion on a lot of, of different planets. Yeah, they're a yeah. star spanning empire. So this is yeah. just like the political center. Yes, but it, the home world is called Scrollos, and it's in a different star system. Thank so. you for reminding me of that. Um, but it, it's. It's fair to say a significant portion of the scroll race is, is destroyed here. Yeah, that's true, and including fact, the, the, the remaining royals. Yeah, and, and they'll return to the consequences of that down the road, actually, in Avengers and the Fantastic Four. Yeah, now, if, uh, before we move on, can I just make Please. another scroll related note? I wanted yeah. to mention this a while ago, but way back in issue 209, in addition to being Burns' first FF art and the first appearance of Herbie, uh, we also <laughs> saw kind of a power shakeup, uh, the first in Marvel history uh, yes. in the Skrull that's Empire, right. in that uh, Emperor Doric... Who has been the leader of the, the the Skrull Empire since the early, like the sometime in the Fantastic Four teens, like number eighteen, I think. Uh, his wife turns on him and kills him and shoots him in the back yep. because he uh, he's, li- he's lily livered. Yeah, the battle against yeah. the Zandarians was going poorly. He was going to retreat, and she just zapped him to try to save the honor. Well, of the she empire. was going to he was going to abandon his, his 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 fleet and just go out, kind of escape on his own. And she was yeah. disgusted. Mm-hmm. So, but she then the Skrull Empire from that point up to. When Galactus devours the throne world, it became, yep. it became a, ma- a matriarchy. Yep. And we also see uh, Princess Anel, whom uh, reader, uh, fans of the Roy Thomas's Kree Scroll War will remember she was That's a right. fairly key character there. And uh, Byrne brings her back here just in time for her to die. That's yeah. right. Well done, Murd. Now, a very interesting plot point in issue 257 Frankie thinks that she may actually be in love with Galactus. You know, she's thinking about how that she's like no other, well, you can't call Galactus a man, but she does. That she's ever known, and and she feels this great concern and tender affection for him. You know, she's trying to help him and and restore him and so forth. So it's just an interesting. Frankie's what they do with her character is very interesting. You you know, she's a cosmic groupie. (laughs) Excuse my language here, and uh, with apologies to Peter Rio, since I think this is what he'd say if he were here. She's a star fucker. Another classic CGS moment from Adam Murdo. Now, 258, one of my all-time favorite issues of the Fantastic Four, entitled Interlude. The cover, Doom's Iron Gauntlet, tearing at the cover of the book. And that's the announcement that this is not going to be your typical Fantastic Four issue. And right from the get-go, when you get to the story, it opens up, and Shane, this reminded me what you were saying before, Doom posing majestically on the parapet of his castle, and he's you know he's ruminating, and it's it, the story is basically a day in the life of Doctor Doom, 
and it takes you through just the day of him with, with interacting with Kristoff, who's now his ward, who's having tutored, who was having tutored, and they actually showed Doom being affectionate with the child, like you know, picking him up and and the the kids laughing and, and happy and so forth. And uh, but it, you know, it's Doctor Doom, so it's never going to be all you know hearts and flowers here. And it's revealed that Doom is preparing a new scheme to ultimately destroy the Fantastic Four, and he's he's. He's got his hands on Tyros, and using his machines, Doom has been able to recreate a portion of the power cosmic, which will now infuse uh, in Tyros or Terax's being. But of course, there's a failsafe. It'll burn T Terax out within five hours or so, and Doom wants to use him as his instrument of vengeance against the FF. I should also point out in the opening page where Doom is posing on his castle with one knee up, he's simply, he's simply thinking... It is good, as he surveys his realm of Latveria. It is good to be Doom. <laughs> and there's a couple great scenes here. One, and again, continuity. Doom is taking Kristoff on his rounds to kind of – he's trying to show Kristoff you know, what it means to rule. And he's inspecting his Doom bots. He notices one of the Doom bots has a scratch, and he, he demands the Doom bot, how did you get this scratch? And he said, oh, when I was you know, interacting with Arcade when we were dealing with the X-Men. So those were two issues where – the X were fighting Doctor Doom and, and Burns say, "No, it wasn't Doom. It was a Doombot." And Doom is is angered that 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 the Doombot allowed Arcade to touch him, so he has the Doombot self destruct. And Kristoff dares innocently because he's a child; he's a little kid. Yeah. He mentions that you know I'll read from the text here. What of the evil mutant known as Magneto Master? I have read that his power rivals even yours. Rivals. No one rivals Doom. No one. And he picks Kristoff by the throat and, and, and he's, he thinks he's going to kill the kid. And then he just he says, get out of my sight. He casts him off. The ego of Doom. Yeah. This, is, this is frightening. I mean, even though Dr. Doom, there's a dark nobility around him. At the same time, Byrne reminds us, as does Mark Wade later in an also very frightening way, Dr. Doom is a cold-blooded killer. And his ego is so all-consuming that he'll even threaten the life of, of, of an innocent child. Who, he's you know, taken care of. Yeah, right. he's taken care of because yeah. he dared question Doom supremacy in all things. Yeah. So it's definitive, Doctor Doom. It's a great story. Now, I have to take my leave. I have parental duties I have to get to with Ben. Of course, Thank my you. friend. I, I also must uh, away at this time. My friends, that was understood. a lot of fun. You'll be missed. Yep, sorry to lose you both. Yeah. But thank you for uh, allowing me to join you again. Anytime. Allowing you. So you're one of the founders of the show. My God. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, Pants is a, runs the show with an iron fist, so I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No yeah. one rivals Pants. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Maybe some trousers, but that's it. <laughs> oh, oh, God. Pantaloons. <laughs> All right. So, thank you. No, thank you. Thank you both. <laughs> now get out. All right. All right, guys. <laughs> Farewell, brothers. Good night, right. Brian. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. All right. Now, issue 259, uh, let's talk about domesticity for a moment. Sue Re and Reed realize we have to give Franklin a, quote, normal life. So they're going to move out of the Baxter building. Again, Burn shaking things up. They're going to move out of the Baxter building, and she buys a whole she, – now she's wearing a wig. She doesn't people know that she's the invisible woman or that she's still the invisible girl at this point. And they purchase a home in a suburb of Connecticut, essentially. And at the same time, Tyrus is on a rampage because he's been given the power cause, not knowing that he's really a pawn of Doctor Doom. And the Silver Surfer is drawn to this struggle because he senses the power cosmic. And the thing, the torch, and Sue are all dragged into this battle. The supermarket is demolished. At the same time, Reed has disappeared, and he's not responding to the FF's you know, signal flares and so forth. And in issue 260, Doom arrives on the scene. And he makes the mistake of trying to take on Terax in one-on-one -on -one combat. And Terax uses the power cause to fuse Doom's armor. So Doom is trapped in his armor and he can't move. His arms are outstretched. And the surfer takes on – because the surfer is trying to protect the earth. And he takes on uh, Terax in a life or death – Shane's embraced me. Take care, brother. <laughs> Drive safe. And he's taking on Terex in a life or death struggle, and of course the surfer prevails because obviously he's far more powerful than, than Terex and more experienced. But as they plummet to Earth, their bodies are almost transformed like a 
cosmic ball of fire, and they fall, they're plummeting right toward Dr. Doom's immobilized form. And Doom says, all right, I have one chance. And Doom does something. You're not sure what. And then we turn to Aunt May, who's one of the bystanders of the battle. Again, Burn reminding us this is all one universe. And she's talking to this man next to her holding gross, and the man suddenly says, cease your idle prattling woman. And he storms to go, hmm, who's that? And Doom is seemingly obliterated by the impact. Tyros is killed. The Silver Surfer prevails. And the FF thinks all that's left of Doom is his faceplate. And they assume, oh, he's finally gone. Is he, though? And at the same time, we, we, there's, a, there's also an interlude with the, with the Submariner, who's, who's inspecting some strange goings-on on, the out, on the, one of the borders of his kingdom. And he's stricken by some mysterious attack, and he turns to Sue, of course, his, his great uh, unrequited love uh, for help. We should mention, and I know Jamie loved the Byrne Submariner series that Byrne also did. Oh, yes, in the early 90s. In the early 90s, which uh, I read bits and pieces of, which was very enjoyable. Now, 261 and 262 is another one of the high watermarks of the Byrne run. The search for Reed Richards and the trial of Reed Richards. And I believe this takes us beyond the, beyond the omnibus. Yes. Of the omnibus, <laughs> yes. Uh, real quick, we talked a lot about uh, John Byrne's art during the, this uh, episode and just mentioned that uh, they made an artist edition, IW did, of uh, John Byrne's work on the FF. Yes, they did. And it includes uh, issues – when I say includes, it's the all-original art, copies of the all-the art from issues 232, the first story of 238, 241, 243, 247. I'm glad Jamie did get – he did get that book. Yes. He did have it, yep. Um 261 is the last one, then, of course, yeah. What If 36. So that's what his uh, art edition includes. Can I always count you for those original art insights? Well, I, I have one more coming up, so pay, pay close Excellent. attention. Wait now, for it. Wait for it. This is an important story. This has been repackaged in trade paperbacks in the past where the ramifications of issue 243, 244 where Reed saved Galactus's life. And remember, Galactus has – consumed untold numbers of worlds. He's been around since the Big Bang. So he's you know killed billions of, 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 of sentient beings. And the Shi'ar and other races kidnap Reed and put him on trial for saving Galactus' life. Now, I have to be honest with you, though. I don't have this issue on hand. I forgot. How did Reed get out of this? Do you remember, Adam? Uh, well, I haven't read the story. But, yeah, I uh, read it years ago. I think it was persuasively argued that uh, Galactus – it might have been the Watcher that showed up. To he did show up. That's right. I remember that because the Galactus is, is – now I remember. He is he's a, he's a, he's an integral part of the order of things. Right. That's, Galactus were to die, part of the grand design. that would disrupt sort of let's say the whole right. – throw off the whole of the, universe. Of the entire yes, universe. Exactly. So that's what happened. Yep. yep. And Reed wasn't even thinking in those terms when he saved Galactus either. He, he just was, saw a sentient being he felt right. he had to preserve. Thought it was the right yeah. thing to do according to his moral code. Yes. Oh, and I could also point out that uh, in the middle of this story, we had uh, Assistant Editor's Month. Oh, Yes. Yeah, a rather more serious story than some yes. of the uh, assistant editors more fair, but, ones, yeah. but we did get to see John Byrne himself and then assistant editor Mike Richards uh, drawn into the story. Byrne has appeared in several of the book issues that he, he's drawn over the years. He, appear, he and Claire might oh, Michael uh, Higgins, sorry. Oh, no problem. <laughs> Not Michael Richards. I know he and, and Claire, Michael Richards. He and Claremont uh, appeared in well, at least one of their X-Men stories as well. 263, 264, the Mole Man comes back. He can't keep the, the FF's original rogue down for long. And he actually – remember, the Mole Man isn't, isn't a fully evil character really, more of a tragic figure. Yeah. And he helps the thing rescue the torch from some subterranean world he's trapped in. It's just a, a fun little two-parter. Uh, then Secret Wars happens, and I'm sure many of our listeners are familiar with the ramifications of that story. And for our purposes here, once the final conflict of battle world is resolved, um, the She-Hulk leaves the Avengers and joins the, the Fantastic Four because the thing decides – He's going to remain on Battleworld because on Battleworld, he doesn't, he doesn't have his mental block, and he can revert back and forth freely from the thing to Ben Grimm. And he decides that he'd rather kind of be on his own on Battleworld. This, of course, the, the thing series mm -hmm. comes out of these events. Do you have anything you want to add about that, Adam? I, I've got a bunch of notes about that, but I'll save them for the end. Okay, so we'll return to that. But this is, this is how She-Hulk comes under the FF essentially. Right. And to She-Hulk – because we have to remember even in the Marvel Universe itself, the FF were revered as the first superhero team. So they're admired by all the other heroes. And so for She-Hulk, this, this is a real thrill really to join the Fantastic Four. 267 is a classic issue in the burn run. 
And here's where I interject again. Please, here. sir. Issue 267 on, on July of 2012, the entire interior original art was sold oh, wow. uh, by Heritage Auctions for – Cover two or just all the – Just the interior, interior art yeah. um, for – Twenty one thousand five hundred and ten dollars. Wow! Which actually, if it's a twenty two page story, it's under a thousand dollars a page. It's burn. It's not that bad, actually. When yeah, you think about it, it. Yeah. That, that was three years ago. As you record yeah. this, I mean, g- generally speaking, when you sell art together like this, you're going to get less for it than if you sold broke it down individually. But I think this is. I love complete stories, original art being kept together. I don't know if it's been broken up since then. I haven't paid attention to the market since then. But again, that that page that's that's w- that's wow, that's quite a purchase. Yeah, that page with uh, the doctor talking to Reed. Yeah, it's just, well, it's devastating. It's all just with all blacked out yes. and right in the center. Yeah, I mean, wow. Well, that that issue. Sue, remember Sue conceived in the negative zone. She's pregnant. Um, but it turns out I think it's because of the radio radioactivity in having the negative to do with, zone. Yeah, right. That it's it's threatened the pregnancy. Right. So um, they bring in uh, well a, a consortium of uh, the, the foremost leading experts on radi- the effects of radiation on human biochemistry right. in the Marvel universe. So we got Bruce Banner, right? We've of course, got, uh, Dr. Walter Lankowski, Sasquatch, Sasquatch. Yep. Got another burn creation. Oh yes, yeah. true. Alpha Flight. Yep. Uh, Dr. Michael Morbius, you know, the yep. living vampire yep. of, of Spider Man, uh, in one of his lucid phases. <laughs> and uh, but uh, the, the, since their combined genius isn't enough to solve the problem, uh, Reed Richards goes after one of yet one more. Uh, expert on radiation, Otto Doctor, Octavius, indeed. who is not really willing to to help, and he has to chase him down. And, and, and at time is of the essence. So Reed's trying to convince Octavius to come back with him. Yes, he's, while he's being he's having kind of a schizoid episode. Yeah, he's he's not in his right mind. And finally, he does. But and the, as Pan's mentioned, this this is this is this is again burn at the peak of his dramatic powers. It's devastating. Reed gets back. Sue lost the baby, and the issue just ends. With just black. He lost maybe like 30 minutes ago. Yeah, it, yeah. it's devastating. Um, and for me, one of the high watermarks of Burns' whole run. I mean, it's, it's a powerful, poignant issue. And again, it's one of those issues where it, it, tra- it, tra- it kind of transcends you know, the stereotype of the comic book medium. No, it's more than that. That This is, this is a powerful, you know, poignant story that, that really goes, goes to the heart. I and mentioned before this is one of the few issues of the burn run that I had read before we started preparing for this episode. Terrific. I picked it up just for the Dr. Octopus appearance. And <laughs> oh, so you didn't know what was going to happen? I was not expecting oh, that. Oh, Murd. And before I got your outline today, yeah. I didn't know anything about this at all. At all. I knew nothing about Sorry this. Sorry to spoil it for you. No, 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 no. I mean, it's fine. Like I said before at the beginning, if I was going to – I knew nothing about this whole era, so I would either have to not listen to the episode at all or yeah. just be you know, aware of what's going on. But so that's why, I like, again, now it wants me to read these stories. Of course, I can read this in the original art form because all the scans are online, of course. <laughs> these issues – one thing I should point out for everybody listening, uh, most of these issues are – Pretty easy to find in back issue bins. In fact, I mean, in my shop, I have, I, whenever I get them, I mean, most of them I just go in the fifty cent bins because they, they were printed in large quantities. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They're, they're not that expensive, and you can really you can easily collect this run. You know, for, I, for, I for not so. that right, much right, money, right. if you want to get get the whole run, it's it's it shouldn't. It sh- if you're paying a lot of money for it, you shouldn't be. And that's not that's not denigrating. These are classics. It's just just nature of the it's the, the nature of the business of right. the, the, the circulation of that time of the eighties. The, these these were in. Being printed in probably larger numbers than they print comics today, um, and they're, they're readily out there. Right. So you don't even need if you don't even buy the omnibus, you can find a lot of these back issues very very easily. Now two sixty eight, uh, she Hulk's she Hulk's assimilating to life in the Fantastic Four, and they do like a, like a mini recap of her origin, and she and Johnny become good buddies, and she kind of reveals her Jennifer Walters ID to him. Not kind of, she does. Remember the She Hulk actually is unlike Bruce Banner; is actually more comfortable. As because she has her complete mental faculties as the She Hulk rather than as you know mousy Jennifer Walters mm-hmm. the lawyer, yep, that's her a, complete mental faculties and an extra helping of confidence. Yes, exactly. Now during the story, Doom's faceplate, which they taken after the events of issue two hundred and sixty, comes to life and starts attacking the FF in their quarters. Quarters, you know, shooting eye beams out of them and so forth. So what's going on here? And in the next issue, uh, Wyatt Wingfoot returns. It, it turns out that – is he – I forgot if he's in New Mexico or Oklahoma. 
Do you remember, Adam, where his tribe is? Of those two, Oklahoma sounds more okay. likely. I mean, in real life, Oklahoma is a site of large Indian reservations. But it turns out that Terminus has surfaced and is uh, – now, Terminus is like a – is he like a poor man's Galactus essentially? Sort of. He's like this, this gigantic alien conqueror and destroyer of worlds. And but it, does he absorb the world's energies or just kind of ravage it essentially? I, I do not know his motivation. Okay. All right. Maybe we don't even know his motivation. Maybe he's supposed to be unknown and unknown. And I think he appears in Avengers too. Oh, yeah. He's, he's been around yeah. in the years since his first appearance here. Is he the is, – is, is, is Terminus though the little person inside the being though? Is that what I'm thinking? Am I thinking that correctly? I, it might be. Yeah. You know, I, I can remember one Which time – That's a very Kirby, Kirby-esque yeah, thing. His outer body was, dis, was damaged badly enough yeah. that he was obliged to uh, well, construct new tissue for it out of yeah. the bodies of mole, moloids, you know, the mole men okay. subjects in Subterranea. So the FF have to uh, take him on. Now what's important here is that in terms of character development – Wyatt and, and, and She-Hulk, Jen Walters, develop a, a attraction for each other, and they'll actually develop a, a full-blown romantic relationship that they'll, that they'll carry out for some time. In fact, the She-Hulk graphic novel, I think, which I think Byrne did, the Marvel graphic novel, mm-hmm. um, he, Wyatt Wingfoot plays a role in that as well. Wyatt Wingfoot is, is, is a steady – he's not always – hasn't been in the FF consistently. Remember, he's Johnny's best pal from the five minutes Johnny went to college, and uh, you know he's, he's appeared many times. He's sort of a stalwart, steadfast, supporting character. Yeah, he recently noble. appealed. He recently appeared in the uh, Charles Sewell Charles Sewell She Hulk series. Well, because the, they they still have a friendship. I take right. it. Yeah. On again, off again for many many years. And he, and he's been in the recent FF issues too, as they're as they're ending that latest volume of the FF. Now, issue two seventy one, Murd would appreciate. Uh, a they celebrate Reed's fortieth birthday, so they're trying to create some kind of sense of time here. And Reed reminisces about his pre FF encounter with Gorbu. All right. <laughs> Very much one of the Atlas era type monsters we've waxed rhapsodic about in the past. Um, so he reads telling that story, and he also realizes that his father may be alive and living on a parallel Earth. So the FF must start exploring again. And issues 272 to 273, the FF cross over into a parallel dimension. Now, Murd, is this like a counter Earth they go to? I forgot what that was. Uh, I don't know what it okay. is. I'm afraid I haven't. But that's where it. Nathaniel, some of the forums can help us. That's where Nathaniel Richards is living, a sort of like a warlord type character. Mm. And, and up until this point, we always thought Reed's father was dead. Correct. Like the, there was no knowledge of him being alive, and now Reed realizes that his father has been always been alive in this other reality. And of course, Nathaniel Richards will play an ongo- a periodic role in FF history, and not always necessarily a clear cut. Benevolent character, oh, either by no means, no, right. no. Very, very, uh, very morally shaky. I mean, he's, yeah. his genius is almost the equal of his son's, but right. he's been far less responsible and ethical in the use of these right. gifts. He's just kind of this crazy explorer and occasional conqueror, and you know, he, he set himself up as a warlord in this yeah. other universe, as right. you said. And and he, he gets to be kind of a bad influence on his grandson uh, eventually. That's right. Okay, well done, Murd. Now, two seventy four, Ben does return from Battle World. But he's fa- he returns to find that – boy, Johnny broke a big rule here. That Johnny has – and this is, and to be fair to Johnny, this isn't just some silly infatuation. He's really in love with Alicia, and they've formed a serious romantic relationship. Now imagine you're Ben Grimm. You come back from Battle World, so you have to assume now his mental block is back in place, and he's just the thing now. And – the woman you left behind, who was the love of your life, is now seriously involved with your one of your best friends, and that's not going to go over well, to say the least. And uh, you know, Ben, he leaves. He he, he leaves the FF again because he, he obviously can't stay there, and he's angry at everyone for this for these developments, essentially. Which he's got a solo series to maintain yeah, that that, also, that as well. He doesn't but, need to be with the FF. Yeah, but in the, in terms of this universe, you know, think of real life. I mean, these things happen where you know. Two, two you know, friends and one ends up with the person, the, the woman or the other guy was with. It happens all the time in real life, and you know, that, that's that's a very complicated situation with a lot of blood, bad blood inevitably. And Ben ha- just – he's I'm, I'm out, and, and he leaves. And he'll, he'll end up with the West Coast Avengers for a brief period of time. I think he goes to Monster Island for a period of time. He kind of wanders around, and as Bird mentioned in his own book. At the same time, uh, Franklin kills and quotes Mephisto. In this story, there's, an, there's, a, there's a situation with him. I'm not sure you can really f- probably truly kill Mephisto, but again, it shows just the sheer awesome scope of Franklin's powers, latent or otherwise. Uh, I should point out again that 
this Alicia Masters in quotes is not really Alicia. Now, I'm sure Byrne intended to be because it was a great way to, to sh- further shake up the character dynamics, but it's revealed later that it's actually a scroll agent named Lija the Laser Fist who infiltrated as Alicia hoping to get close to Ben, but Ben's on battle roll, so then she settles on Johnny. But it turns out that Lija actually really falls in love with Johnny. And when we get to the uh, 90s, which for me is not necessarily about you know about the high watermark of FF stories, but I'll shoulder some of the burden then because yeah. this is that's when I started reading comics. And I'm gonna, the FF I'm, was one of the first. I'm going to appreciate that because that's, that's going to be some stuff. That stuff's going to be tough to slog through. But Lige will actually become, uh, in many ways, a full full flooded member of the team um, in those years. Uh, but obviously, in, in this time period, you you think it's Alicia Masters. No, there's no indication at all that she's a scroll. So now two seventy eight to two seventy nine. Kristoff, who's been kind of warped by Doom. Now, Doom, we don't know where Doom is. We assume that, well, the, allegedly he's dead, but you know he, he's not in Latveria because he was supposedly atomized when Tyros and the Silver Surfer crashed into him. But Kristoff has put on a version of Doom's armor, and he actually launches the Baxter building into space, and the Baxter building is destroyed. And that will lead Reed to eventually build Four Freedoms Plaza. Which will become the FF second headquarters for a period of time. In the midst of these goings on, we get a, a Burnian retelling of Doom's origin. That's right. Thank you, sir. Which n- you can't go wrong with that. No, never. Now, uh, Brian Deemer mentioned malice before in our, the early part of our discussion. Um, that becomes a, a major plot point here. Issues 280 to 284. Mer, remind us of the significance of the hate monger, please. Oh, well, this is, I think, the th- Third hate monger character. Yeah, that I know there's there more been. than one iteration yeah, the, of the hate The original monger, was like a, a clone of Adolf Hitler, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, this one is a construct uh, created by uh, the Psycho, Psycho Man. Man. Yep. You know, there's a scientist from the microversal world of Tron who has uh, <laughs> his specialty is the manip- manipulation of emotions. Right. Okay, he's got this. And he's been around since the Silver Age. Mm-hmm. Yep. And so here he's uh, developed this uh, this uh, biological construct in human form. Goes by the name of H. Uh, H. U. Munger, I think. Uh, <laughs> you know, so it's just kind of a, a, a two-legged extension of his uh, little emotional control board that he carries. And uh, he, this creature, this hate monger, has the power to inspire fear and manipulate it in others. And uh, he uh, gets his uh, talons into Sue Storm, Sue Richards' psyche. And uh, starts manipulating her, and uh, well, uh, and he's, he's able to unleash uh, hate and fear in her, and also throughout New York City. There's bedlam, racial slurs are being cast about. I mean, it's 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 brutal. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead, sir. No, I, I think that's it's pretty much gotten down to it. And Sue is the hate monger as this proxy of Psycho Man brings out the sort of the dark aspect of Sue's nature. She puts on this very risque outfit. Oh yes, um, leather straps and yes. spikes. The FF are forced to actually confront Sue in battle, and if I remember correctly, Reed snaps her out of it. He might even slap her. I don't recall. I think he, I think he does, and she's snapped out of it, um, but of course she's basically been psychically raped, and she feels violated by what happened to her, and uh, she, wants, she, wants to, she wants revenge for what happened to her, and, and Reed finally relents. They go – because yeah. he was kind of hesitant. Yeah. And, she can't take it out on the hate monger, by the way, because uh, this is happening at the same time as Secret Wars 2. That's right. And Sue, as Malice, shows up in that series with the hate monger goading her on, but then Scourge pops out of an alleyway and kills the hate monger. So, Good old Scourge. Mm-hmm. Reliable uh, supervillain exterminator of the 80s. So. Of the, the B and C level supervillains. Yeah. So Sue's going to have her vengeance. Psycho Man has yep. to be on the receiving end. So they travel to the microverse, and uh, you know, Reed explains, of course, and as you have, Adam, that you don't – the microverse isn't – they're not tiny people. You just have to shrink down – to a, an infinitesimally small size right, to the, get to breach right, that access portal. point yeah. is tiny. So, so they find the psycho man and Sue. I, I, I want to say she uses this device against him, and she incapacitates him and, and gets her come up. He gets his comeuppance in a sense. But and she's so, but she's so sort of hardened by the experience. She says, "All right, from now on, I'm the invisible woman." So in a sense, this is sort of a, a baptism of fire for Sue when it comes to her sense of identity, and that's when she takes on. The nom de guerre of the Invisible Woman. Right. Culmination of uh, well, this, this evolution of her character that Burns has been working on almost since he first came on the book. Very – especially yeah. that Barbara Walker's inter- – Walker right. we were talking right. about before. In, back in 245, yeah. And as, again as a side note on this issue, again, always re- re- returning to studies of what, what's going on with Franklin and his latent powers, he has a dream of power pack. 
And as we know, that was a really fun 80s series. I think Louis Simonson was the creator there. Um, and again, Mer, just remind us of the origins of Power Pack. Um, well, they're the four children of a prominent scientist on Earth, and um, they find the – power, uh, power children? Yeah, the, yeah that yeah, was their right, family right, name, right. Power. Yeah, Alex, Julie, Jack, and uh, Katie Power. And uh, so this, uh, this alien spaceship, um, a smart ship, you know, it, has, it has an artificial intelligence on board. It calls itself Friday because it's a fan of Earth literature. It's named itself after Robinson Crusoe's companion. And uh, this uh, smart ship crashes to Earth. It's being pursued by wicked aliens that it is named Snarks. Their real name is Znarks or something like that. But uh, <laughs> you know, after the Lewis Carroll, uh, the hunting of the snark, yeah. uh, that story, uh, the, the, the smart ship Friday has called them Snarks. And it empowers the four power children uh, to help uh, you know, protect it against uh, these aliens that are pursuing it. And they keep the powers afterwards and have adventures as little uh, pint-sized superheroes. And Franklin is Tattletail. That's his right. code name. Uh, that's the name he takes. And he wears his little shirt with the fantastic four and a half symbol on it. <laughs> And I just remember the classic 80s moon boots the Power Pack team was wearing. And again, and again Power Pack is still around. They've been in the Future Foundation. They're still very present in the Marvel Universe. Yeah, they're great characters, too great yeah. to allow to fade into limbo. Now, issue 285, very poignant story. Uh, a little boy who's troubled, picked on, isolated, he looks up to the Human Torch, and he wants to emulate the Human Torch. And we find out that he actually set himself on fire. And he ends up in the burning unit, and he's dying. And the torch goes to visit him, and the torch is horrified. The kid's parents blame Johnny for what happened to their son, and the torch is totally distraught over this situation. And he says, I quit. I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave the Fantastic Four. And I think, actually, if I remember correctly, in the Marvel Omnibus, the 75 greatest Marvel stories that came out uh, last year, this issue is one of them that the voters selected. It's it's a very powerful story, and the Beyonder because again it's Secret Wars two as Murd mentioned the Beyonder shows up, and he convinces the Torch by kind of taking him through a journey that you know he should remain as the Human Torch remain part of the Fantastic Four that what happened with that child really you know there are other forces in his life that put him that direction it really wasn't his fault so the Torch you know con continues to re retain the mantle of the of, of the Human Torch. Okay, we're now we're approaching the. The last few issues of Burns' run, um, there's, there's a couple major arcs still to address here. Uh, one is of enormous significance to the Marvel Universe as a whole and, and specifically to the X-Men. Issue 286 crosses over the Avengers 263, the return of Jean Grey. And uh, many listeners are no doubt familiar with this where it's revealed that the true Jean Grey was not Phoenix – who died in the Dark Phoenix saga, that that was the cosmic entity who tricked itself into thinking it was Jean Grey, had taken on essentially the essence and personality and, and, and values of Jean Grey. And the real Jean Grey, who was dying from radiation poison while she was potting in the space shuttle uh, during the classic uh, X-Men uh, issue 100 and 101, which we discussed on our X-Men spotlights uh, back in 2013, she was sort of put in suspended an animation. And when the shuttle crashed into Jamaica Bay... The Jean Grey that emerged was really the phoenix, and the real Jean Grey was kind of left in this stasis cocoon, and it's, it's, it's f uncovered by the Avengers, and they, you know, they break, Reed Richards is staying in the mansion because the Baxter building is being rebuilt as Four Freedoms Plaza, and they, they realize that it's Jean Grey, and of course this is going to pick up an X Factor. That, that series starts where they, where they reconstitute the original X-Men and, and all the circumstances and consequences of Jean Grey being back. And you know what? What? what and, and I was reading in the background that apparently Claremont had a role in this story, of course, because you know he's, he's the, the, still the major X Men scribe at this time. And apparently, Byrne didn't agree with the way they brought Jean Gay, Gray back. I think he had a different. He wanted a different interpretation of her return. But be that as it may, what we get is this explanation that the Phoenix is its own cosmic entity. That incorporated the essence of Jean Grey. So Jean Grey today – well, Jean, well, Jean Grey is dead again. But Jean, <laughs> Jean Grey has the memories of the Phoenix. She knows everything the Phoenix did because the Phoenix, down to the molecular level, had basically convinced itself it was Jean Grey. So just – it's a little confusing, but that's, that's, how they, that's how they maneuvered bringing her back essentially into the Marvel Universe. And uh, Byrne had some help from uh, his old X-Men cohort Terry Austin in this issue. Uh, yes, that's right. Well done, sir. Did the guest inks. Tremendous anchor. And the original art for, <laughs> issue, 
for issue <laughs> 286, sold less than a year ago in August of 2014 with all the goodies for almost $39,000. Oh so the whole the whole story. The cover to issue 286. Just the cover? Just the was cover. Was 39 grand. 39 grand. All right, 287 and 288. But the last major story Byrne does here in his run. And he, he returns to explaining what actually happened to Dr. Doom. And it's revealed that – now, Merle preached this. This goes back to the Ovids. Why don't you explain that, Adam? Uh, the Ovoids were an alien race um, who uh, hadn't had much uh, traffic with other alien races, I don't think. They were a little on the naive side. And uh, they uh, taught Dr. Doom uh, the art of uh, mental projection, of uh, trans – well, uh, psychically transferring one's mind from your body into another. And that's how Dr. Doom was able to save his life by uh, possessing the body of that poor guy with the groceries standing next to Aunt May. Yep. And then Doom returns to the home of this man, and the man's wife, just a normal middle-class suburban housewife, realizes that oh, this is not – what's going on with my husband? And I remember there's a funny line where she says, my husband sounds like Arnold Schwarzenegger. So Doom is giving – you know. Uh, Burton is giving Doom an accent, you know, <laughs> a, 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 some kind of Balkan accent essentially. Oh, isn't he Austrian? No, he's Latvian. No, no, I mean oh, Schwarzenegger is Austrian. Yes, <laughs> yeah. he is. Sorry, pants. That was silly of me. That's okay. Um, so, long story short, Reed figures out that the Beyonder, when the Beyonder did the Secret Wars, when he brought Doom into the Secret Wars, he pulled Doom from the future. In the future, from these events we're talking about right now. So, because Doom. Gets he switches he switches he attacks the FF it, but he's wearing the arm but he's in the body of this poor schlub that he's taken over, and the Beyonder is summoned and Reed realizes that Doom doesn't know who the Beyonder is, so he realizes that the Doom they're dealing with is not in the proper place in the time stream, and the Beyonder is it can just disposes of Doom very quickly and and Reed convinces the bot Beyonder look he says he tells the Beyonder you have to restore Doctor Doom. To the proper – his proper place in the time stream. Otherwise, if you don't, it will muck up the entire time continuum. So the poor schlub whose name I've forgotten is returned to his body and he goes back to his wife. And Doom is now – the Beyonder reworks things where Doom is going to be brought back from the Secret Wars battle world to that point where he should be now in the present. So the FF Lee before Dr. Doom actually returns – and sort of the Beyonder sort of – it's kind of confusing, but he kind of reasserts – And now I've gone cross eyes. Yeah, he reasserts the, t the proper – it's basically a way to explain how Dr. Doom can still be around. Sure. So they, they bring him back. Sure. And it, it's clever the way Byrne does it. It's a really fun story, especially you know, the, the, the poor housewife. She's like caught in the middle of this and tries to make these very you know, serious decisions about what to do with her husband and so forth and so on. So it's a good, it's a good, it's a good two-parter. 289 to 290. It's a fun blast star. Annihilus is not dead, of course. He comes back. Anything you wanted to add about that, Murd? Uh, not a thing. Yeah, it's, it's n n not nothing momentous. Uh, 291 is fun. The FF end up in, in, a, in a 1936-era universe, a reality. And there's a great uh, homage-covered Action Comics number one <laughs> uh, in this issue. I'm sure P Pants is sort appreciating that. Sort of reverse that. image, yeah, if yeah, you will. Yeah, but, but they have like the people grasping their hands oh, yeah, in the yeah, foreground. Yeah, yeah. And in this story, issue 292 – Nick Fury is trapped in this reality with the FF, and he decides to kill Adolf Hitler. And there's a, there's a great cover of Hitler giving the salute, the Nazi salute, and, and, and Fury is sneaking behind him with a gun. And the FF's debating whether or not we should we let Nick Fury do this, what we'll do to time, and so forth. And we've got to stop him, or, or do, do we? Yes. <laughs> and if memory serves, Fury does kill Hitler, but the FF end up back in their reality. And the last Burn issue was 293, and and Burn kind of leaves in mid. I think it leaves in mid-arc at this point. Uh, kind of, yeah. yeah. The, the next issue is uh, it's credited as a co-plotted by yeah. himself and Roger Stern, but uh, he's office penciler Jerry Ordway takes over yeah, and, him. So. I mean Stern and Ordway, that's not, that's not a slouch team by any stretch. And remember, Byrne and Stern worked together on that magnificent Captain America run uh, from the early 1980s. Uh, Mer, do you have any notes on annuals? Because we have annual 17, for example. Oh, uh, well, I, I don't have a whole lot, actually. That's um, okay. Annual 17, which is in the omnibus, that which Byrne did, they revisit the scrolls who read turn into cows. Uh-huh. And it's re this is very clever. It's revealed that those cows were milked, so their milk ended up 
uh, you know, sort of out there, and this whole town, nearby town where these cows were uh, uh, grazing, ended up becoming, in a sense, infected by this scroll laced milk. Yep. So they gain uh, shape changing abilities. Yeah, they don't become true also- scrolls. But it's almost like invasion of the body snatchers. Like they, everybody in the town becomes very uh, paranoid, paranoid, xenophobic, warlike because they're scrolls and, and they can transform into anything they imagine. And the FF uh, Julie's roommate, I forgot her name. Her name is Sharon Selick, who has a, who's the hots for Johnny. <laughs> oh my God, no pun intended. Well done, sir. <laughs> She's actually uh, being hunted by the the, t- the townspeople who, who are like living in this insular world now. And it's it's a, it's a fun again, kind of a fun Twilight Zone type story where the FF arrive in the town and they figure out what's actually going on, and Reed realizes, my God, the decision we made all the way back was that the issue two, of uh, the scrolls, yeah, yeah, the consequences of what we did, and uh, and there's a great moment at the end again, a nice Twilight Zone moment where Reed thinks, all right, everything's all well and good, the people have been restored, and then you see a truck delivering, a, a, you know, tanks tanks of milk to a nearby army base. <laughs> That's how that issue ends. Annual 17, yes. original cover artwork, <laughs> November 2013, $22,700. Oh God. God, who has this kind of money? <laughs> not you or I, apparently. <laughs> not 99% of the population. Holy mackerel, it's impressive. Merv, what do you got on your fabled uh, yellow legal pad notes there? Uh, well, one uh, – really only one uh, additional note I'm finding here about uh, the Fantastic Four ongoing itself. Uh, yeah. Number 275. Uh, it's really more of a She-Hulk thing than an FF thing, but that's the, the famous Naked Truth story. Oh, right. You're a sleazy photographer. Uh, she's, takes, she's bathing top, some bathing topless. Yeah, right? like yeah. up on the roof of Four Freedoms, and yeah. uh, this guy gets a, a candid snap of it and uh, yeah. threatens to sell it, and uh, then uh, She-Hulk goes on a rampage. And uh, so it's – well, it's it, – is it sort of topical? I mean yeah. tabloid journalism oh, yeah. was – Full swing by then. Yeah, yeah. certainly. And, and just uh, – I was just uh, – a, a woman's right to a well, uh, well, pri- well you know, privacy is maybe even too limited a term, but uh, uh, well, ownership of her own body essentially. Well, yeah, yes, yeah. As a, and all images and depictions yeah. thereof. Yeah. So, so the She-Hulk being that, you know, thusly violated and exploited, you know, as, as you know, if you think about it, uh, many uh, well, female superhero characters are, especially yes. going into the uh, the nineties and the, oh, the yeah. bad girl movement. Um, so yeah, burn stories yeah. movement. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's kind of flashing forward to burn when he would uh, you know do the She Hulk solo series, yeah. which is wonderful. Mm-hmm. We can talk about that down the road. Lots of fun. Um, but this one was uh, also there, there was definitely a humorous uh, sort of ridiculous element to it, but uh, also kind of serious because this kind of exploitation takes place. And we should mention just as a quick aside, in case people aren't some people aren't familiar with the She Hulk series, burn did a lot of satire. He breaks the fourth wall in that book quite a yeah. bit. I mean, it, it's 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 a it's an innovative book uh, and, and well worth reading. So now you have notes on the Thing series, correct? Oh, I'm yes. sorry, real quick. And yeah. the original art <laughs> to the cover to Fantastic Four two seventy five is up for auction yeah. in a, in May of 2015. So if you're looking to get one of these covers, here's your chance, boys and girls. I'm trying to save for my retirement, so it's probably not <laughs> a good idea. <laughs> What do you got? What do you got, Adam? Okay, the, the legendary thing. yellow legal pad. Okay, yeah, I, I've got a bunch of notes about Marvel two and one two, but that's uh, kind of tangential to the main FF. So you know what? By the way, I wanted to say, I'm going to say it here on the air. I think at some point down the road we should do a Marvel team up two and one spotlight. Oh, Brian. joy of joys! <laughs> you, you, you're, you're into that idea, Brian? Well, I'm getting the issues. I'm almost finished with the Marvel Marvel team up. You heard it here is, first, is, is folks. Thing, right? Yeah, Marvel two and I one need is the two thing. issues to finish that run. Well, it is is the shorter of the two. Yippee! Yay! Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know if we'll, we'll get to it any time this year, but we'll put it in the queue. Well, yes. Well, you know, Pants and I are both big fans. I of know those, you are. That's uh, one of the reasons why titles. I thought it'd be a good thing to do. So, yeah. So, so in that case, yeah. well, there were a couple of issues drawn by Burn in yeah. uh, Marvel Two and One. I might as well mention that. Um, for example, the uh, Project Pegasus Saga, classic issues uh, fifty three through fifty eight. I think like the first uh, two issues of that were drawn by John Byrne. Um, okay, but. Uh, 
Uh, like I said, that's really more the the thing having adventures out in the Marvel universe yeah. with a bunch of co stars. But uh, the thing solo series, actually entitled the thing, right, is a little closer to the, the heart of the Fantastic Four. So uh, that began. You now it's and and John Byrne did write you know, a significant fraction of this series. So since this is FF and the Byrne years, uh, so the first issue was cover dated uh, July of nineteen eighty three. Uh, it was uh, written by John Byrne with the uh, art by Ron Wilson, and uh, long time Marvel two and one artist. Oh right? yes, yeah. yes indeed. Actually, he the, the same creative team, uh, John Byrne and uh, Ron Wilson, also uh, did the final issue of Marvel two and one, which came out the month before June of nineteen eighty three, and that was the thing teaming up with Ben Grimm. It's, it's kind of a callback to issue number fifty of Marvel two and one, which is included in the omnibus. Where he here. fights the older, the original version of the thing. Right, right. Yeah. the thing, yeah, the remembrance of things past <laughs> was the title. So yes, uh, the current, the present day Ben Grimm uh, having a dust up with the uh, very early Fantastic Four Ben Grimm, who still had the dinosaur hide and uh, uh, spoken kind of high flown phrases for some reason, <laughs> and uh, so the thing was able to give uh, the Reed Richards of that time period uh, the the specifics of a cure for the thing's condition. So the younger thing was cured, but uh, then the present day thing returned to his own time period and discovered that uh, that cure did not do him any good because when you travel back in time, you create in another universe, reality. Yeah. yeah, you cannot alter history. All you can do is create a divergent reality. Right. Uh, so that was the plot of uh, Fantastic Four number 50. I believe uh, number 100, the last issue of Marvel 2 and 1, was uh, the thing revisiting this alternate reality, Ben Grimm, who re- had his humanity restored. And we see how reality was affected in the long run by that. Uh, and that leads right into the following month, The Thing number 1, by Byrne, Ron Wilson, and inks by Joe Sinnott. Uh, the Thing revisits Yancey Street and uh, retells his uh, early days to uh, members of the gang there. <laughs> uh, so, we, we, so we see some new details about uh, Ben's childhood. We see some more of his Uncle Jake. We learn that he has a big brother named Danny Grimm, Daniel Grimm Jr., uh, who actually died as a young man. And so some so in, insights into the thing's past. That continues into the thing number two, which is also included That's in right, the omnibus. Yep. It's by the same creative team. We see a glimpse of the college years of uh, Ben Grimm and Reed Richards and uh, the tragic story of one of the thing's old girlfriends, uh, Aileen Cambers. That's right. Uh, who was a big movie star. Uh, you know, she she dumped the thing just because she thought uh, she was going to hurt him eventually when right. she ran away to Hollywood to become an, an actress. And we learn that she's had a stroke and she comes back into the thing's life and says, oh, you've learned how to cope with a horrible accident that made you something less than so what you, you once help were. Me, help me to cope. Yeah. And she falls into his big rocky arms yeah. and uh, the thing has promises to you know, give her what help he can. Uh, issue number three is an inhuman story. And issue number four. Now, I mentioned earlier uh, what, the, what befell the puppet master after Doom yes. – or Doombot apparently squashed him <laughs> in Littleville. Well, in issues number five and six, uh, we uh, the puppet master is back in a, a body composed entirely of his radioactive clay. So he gains uh, sort of shape-shifting powers for a bit there. He was able to physically transform himself into any being he wanted and then by his actions manipulate that being. Into, so he became one of his own radioactive clay voodoo dolls. Nifty little uh, footnote in the Puppet Man's history. I read about that in Ohatmu. Always wondered where it happened, and it happened for these two issues of the thing, numbers five and six. And then his radioactive clay body is destroyed. Good old Ohatmu. Um, let's see. Jumping ahead, then uh, to issue number ten is a Secret Wars tie-in, and then issue now, is he on Battle World for some of these? Sto- he's on Battle World at this point. Right? Um, oh, that, that begins actually I'm sorry. Okay. in issues ten yeah. and eleven, yeah. and he's there. Yeah, that that is when the, the Secret Wars uh, divergence happens. Right. And, uh, so that's when the Thing uh, the series ceases to be set on Marvel Earth. Right. And uh, the arc that is known as Rocky Grimm Space Ranger begins. <laughs> Because as you said earlier, Chris, while on Battleworld, uh, uh, in the wake of the Secret Wars, the Beyonder grants everyone on Battleworld, on the winning side, the heroes, um, a wish. Yeah. And uh, so the the thing's wish, I guess, was to be able to become human again. And uh, since uh, the, 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 the sort of psychosomatic mental block that he has, uh, you know, the fear that Alicia Masters will reject him mm-hmm. if he becomes human again, uh, since he's uh, far away from Alicia – and uh, her thoughts and emotions are no longer 
you know, influencing him too much, so he's able to shed that, and uh, so now he can become uh, the thing, or uh, or he can revert to his human form of Ben Grimm at will, and he decides to just stay on Battle World and have adventures there for a while. So the rest of the Fantastic Four go home, and as we have, you know, history takes its course, and the, the She Hulk joins the right. team. But meanwhile, the Thing is uh, having the sort of uh, you know, Flash Gordon style adventures up there on Battle World, and the first thing he does actually in issue number twelve, uh, he has a clash with Doctor Doom who is uh, also still out there. Um, in issue number 14, um, uh, Byrne takes a break because he was a little overworked. This I can imagine. One has yeah. to think. So Mike Carlin actually takes over okay. as writer for a few issues, uh, starting at issue number 14. Uh, we're introduced to uh, Grimm the Sorcerer, who is kind of a, an alter ego of Ben Grimm, somehow externalizes some aspect of his psyche in human form, <laughs> who there on Battleworld gains sorcerous powers and becomes Ben's like nemesis during his adventures on Battleworld. Because every hero needs that nemesis. Sure. And it, 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 it's an aspect of himself. Right. It's, yeah, it's perfectly Jungian. Uh, then... What else we got? Uh, so he acquires sort of a small supporting cast, uh, mainly consisting of this uh, red-headed warrior woman named Tariana. Uh, and she sort of becomes his love interest. Um, so um, these are all people pulled from the Beyonder from these different planets into this patchwork planet. Right, that's created. right, right yeah. exactly. Battle World is kind of a gestalt, which right. is kind of what uh, the, the new Battle World in the new Secret Wars is going to be. Except Looks like it's, it, yeah. it's bits and pieces of uh, alternate realities, right. as opposed to bits and pieces of planets within right. one universe. Uh, but uh, it's it's a diverse enough landscape that uh, John Byrne and his uh, uh, fellow writers were able to milk no end of interesting stories out of Ben's time on Battle World. Um, Bob Harris writes issue number 18, just a quick one shot. Then Burn comes back in number 19, which is a monster mash. Uh, that's the title. It guest stars a bunch of Marvel Universe monsters, including Great. Dracula, Frankenstein's monster, and so forth. And it's a crossover with uh, one of the issues of the Fantastic Four. Um, and I don't think I'm going to be able to find the note I have here about that in time to mention it. So, But uh, apparently there was a, a monster mash issue of the Fantastic Four happening concurrently with that issue number 19. Um, uh, the Space Ranger arc uh, finally ends at number 22. Uh, Tariana, his new lady love, dies, of course. Um, and uh, Ben returns to Earth the final issue, the following issue, number 23. Um, Burn having come back to finish up the uh, Rocky Grimm Space Ranger arc. Uh, Carlin now comes back as writer number 23 and stays as on as writer through pretty much the end of the series. Uh, so uh, first thing back on Earth in issue number 24, uh, the thing fights the rhino. A fun story there. Rhino! <laughs> <laughs> and meanwhile, Scourge shows up again in the background and Why kills not? one of the Fantastic Four's oldest enemies, the Miracle Man. That's right. Okay, that's right. Yep. So that he dies there. Um, issue number 27, uh, the thing hooks up with one of the more embarrassing uh, Marvel concepts of the 80s. Remember Team America? How could I, how could I forget? <laughs> the, the stunt cycle team. Yeah, the they super stunt cycle. They fight Hydra often, yeah. <laughs> They fight who? They would often fight Hydra. Hydra? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, thought, I thought you said Hydroth. No. Okay. Uh, I can just imagine what kind of lame villain Hydroth would be. <laughs> so, yeah, they have the ability to merge into this uh, unimind Captain Planet type. Uh, the Mast uh, mass Marauder? Uh, I the, think that was his name. The, it was the Black something. Yeah, I, it's, uh, I forgot. Black Marauder, Black Marauder. The Mast Marauder is the guy from Spectacular Spider-Man. Right, yeah. right. Like Frank, Frank Farnham, yeah, yeah. the criminal scientist guy. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, the, apparently Marvel lost the uh, right to use the licensed name Team America. Mm -hmm. So by the thing number 27, they have to call them Thunder Riders in the Marvel wow. Universe. That's all one word with a shared R, Thunder Riders. Uh, and uh, the thing hooks up with this group because uh, he saw one of their posters and saw on there um, the image of a young redheaded woman who reminds him a lot of his lost Tariana. Okay. Uh, so he, he's he's emotionally vulnerable at this point. Right. He's lost Tariana. He's come home and discovered that uh, Alicia has uh, Johnny, yeah. run to the arms of Johnny. So he's really in an emotional tailspin. Um, but So he sees this poster, and that's enough to get him to seek out the Thunder Riders. He discovers that uh, the image he saw on the poster belonged to a young lady named Sharon Ventura. Ah, yes. Who has uh, recently become a member of the group uh, of the Thunder Riders. The Thing tries out for them as well. Um, but um, – uh, neither he nor Sharon Ventura stay with them for longer than the space of an issue. By issue number 28, the thing joins up with the Unlimited Class Wrestling That's Federation. Right. As the Sharon, correct? Uh, yes, yeah, as the yeah. Sharon. And she becomes uh, the new Ms. Marvel. That's right. That's her costumed wrestling identity. And eventually she uh, sees uh, the power broker, 
you know, the Curtis Jackson yes. by name. He, uh, he's the one who's uh, selling superpower treatments mm-hmm. to uh, would-be uh, you know, superpowered operatives, including many members of the Unlimited Class Wrestling mm-hmm. Federation because they are um, an exclusively superhuman right. uh, wrestling group. And uh, the thing uh, has some run-ins with the Grapplers, a group of lady wrestlers who had been introduced uh, some time ago in Marvel 2 and 1. Um, issue number 28 is also the first appearance of D-Man. Ah, Yes. Dennis Demolition Dunphy yep. who eventually became a, a reserve Avenger. And he was a character in Captain America too, yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in issue number 30 is a Secret Wars 2 uh, tie-in. The Beyonder shows up. Issue number 31, the thing finds its way to Hollywood and participates in the making of Devil Dinosaur the movie. <laughs> Um, issue number 34 sees the return of the Sphinx, uh, who uh, resurrects the Puppet Master. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure why, but uh, that's how the Puppet Master comes back after you know, becoming a being of living clay and then right. being destroyed. Uh, and then finally, uh, you know, issues number 35 through 36 – uh, the, 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 those issues are drawn by Paul Neary, you know, some of the few issues of the entire series not drawn by Ron Wilson. Okay. And uh, the series ends with issue number 36, uh, June of 1986. Thank you, sir. I mean that's, I'm glad you brought up the thing because you know, the important things in his, in his history happen in that series. So uh-huh. it's good to address it. Yeah, for nothing else, we had to bring up Sharon Ventura because yeah. she becomes a pretty important supporting character. And a tragic character too yeah. down in, the In the FF in the yeah. late 80s, early 90s. Wow. Well, I have no idea how long we've been going. Over three hours because I had some computer issues right now. So before we lose the whole episode, I'm just going to wrap it up. We could talk about this forever, obviously. Mm. Thank you again, Professor Eberly, for your wonderful notes. Jamie, I hope we did you proud. Yes, mm. I like to think we did. And once again, this episode was brought to you by SuperheroStuff.com. You can go to for all of your superhero, superhero stuff. stuff. And it was also brought to you by Scribd. Go to scribd.com, that's S-C-R-I-B-D.com slash comic geek speak for your free 30-day trial. If you want to leave us a voicemail, the number is 267-702-6642. You can send us an email, we're comicgeekspeak at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, we're comic geek speak. You can talk back about this episode as well as many other topics at thecomicforums.com. We want to thank everyone who contributed to the show. We really appreciate it. Could not do without you. And as always, we are uniting the world's mightiest heroes, one listener at a time. Uniting the world!